Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com You uh, you state in the book that most of the individuals that were doing the training uh, in Georgia, most of them were white men, correct? Yeah, they were mostly, probably all of them, 99.9% of them, yes, were white men. Okay. Uh, and you said uh, that, I guess, when your group was going through, that you had 25 uh, trainees, uh, seven of them were females, the rest were males. Uh, how many of the trainees were black? Um... Only a handful. Matter of fact, me and another girl, we were the only blacks in our class. So it was only a few blacks that was actually going through the school at that time. Wow. And most of the blacks who went to the school were flunked out in the school. Even people with master degrees and doctorate degrees actually flunked the course down at Glencoe, Georgia. They flunked out. Wow. That When I made the asterisk uh, for listeners and telling them to kind of keep that uh, in mind, uh, I wanted to make sure we covered that as well because I thought that was real significant. Uh, you shared that uh, the tests that you all had to pass uh, to complete the training, uh, these were open book and ostensibly is supposed to be impossible uh, to fail this school. Uh, but as you just touched on, that was not the case uh, for black people, non-white people who went through the training. And even though it's not even that many of them apparently who were going through the training at the time, uh, this is... Uh, the same page uh, in the book, the Kathy Harris story, uh, where you go into more detail about this, uh, you write, uh, even though most of the trainees felt unsure about how to capture and handcuff a violator, they were hoping to get additional on-the-job training at their designated U.S. Customs ports. But as many ports, especially in Atlanta, that training never came. Before the open book tests, the failure rate at the training facility was high, especially for blacks and Hispanics. They were not expected to survive the training. Uh, they, ex they were not expected to survive the training. The gossip around the training school was about how many black and Hispanic employees were failing the courses. Blacks with master's and doctorate degrees could not pass various stages of the training. We would talk, joke, and laugh with someone night one night and the next day the person would be gone before the open book tests considering the tactical exercises and written comprehension tests in the academy an equivalent number of whites should have also failed the course however most whites received a passing grade even at times to their own surprise really important segment I thought um, this, as you already touched on, was some years ago. Do you have any knowledge if this has changed? Has, has anything been done to kind of rectify this seeming act of racism to keep non-white people from passing through the training stage? No, but right now, because it is open book test, from my understanding, a lot of people are able to pass the course now because it is open. Like I say, you sit there and you write the answers down. It's open book, so it should be hard to really fail now if you go through the training. What, because it was open book then, I guess, do you have an idea of what specifically was being done to eliminate these potential black recruits? 
No, I mean, a lot of things in the government can be done behind the scenes. It's simply that, you know, they could let a certain number of blacks pass, a certain number of blacks not pass, you know. So the federal government, that's just how it works. I mean, we weren't privy to who was grading the test. We weren't privy to those people and, and how they were doing everything. So we, we had no information about that, but a lot of the people, like I said, had a master degree, they had doctor degree, and they could not pass that course. Wow. This seems like, I don't know if it's changed or what have you, but at least from the time that you're writing about it, it seems like if a white person or several of these white people, if they picked out a black person, a non-white person, and said, we want to make sure that whoever this person is, we want to make sure that they don't, they don't complete the training successfully. It seems like it would be pretty easy to do that, even if they were, you know, trying their best, keeping up, studying the books. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. Later on, some people who actually worked down there had told people back at other places that that's exactly what they did. They were able to flunk certain people out of the school. Context of white supremacy. Mm. Before... Uh, Move forward, you obviously passed the training course and moved on to El Paso where same thing continue. Uh, before I moved on, I just want to read this final. Uh, this is how you close this chapter of the book. Uh, you write, at every turn, blacks and Hispanics were expected to fail or quit. Non-white students who were not systematically funked, flunked from the training school were frequently eliminated from the federal work system, especially law enforcement, without just cause. In retrospect, I realize these exclusionary tactics were used by the Customs Service to weed out black and Hispanic employees. The non-whites who managed to eventually enter the system were held back through promotions, negative work reviews, job harassment, etc., or eliminated at the next level by a mostly white chain of command. Racial and sexual profiling and discrimination occurs quite often at all federal law enforcement agencies. Racial profiling within the federal law enforcement agencies was the accepted norm. The message conveyed to blacks continually and mercilessly was and is giving your best is not enough. I quickly concluded that yes, the customs inspector job paid a very good salary. However, what a person had to endure, especially blacks and Hispanics, eventually extracted an even higher price, loss of respect, integrity, and self-esteem. I think that's Terry McMillan that wrote How Stella Got Her Groove Back. Uh, what what was the correlation? Like, what was it about that book that prompted the, the increase uh, for black female passengers if they were coming uh, from the Caribbean for them to be stopped? What what was significant about that book? Well, you know, the book. what did the book say? The book said that women in Jamaica had a great time, right? So you would not believe how many black women in this country went to Jamaica. And because they went to Jamaica... Somehow, U.S. Custom put down an unwritten rule. They said, we can now pull over all these black women and get away with it. So basically, so any black woman that came back into the U.S. from Jamaica, after that book came out, they were pulled over by U.S. Custom and taken into the secondary area. Fascinating. Wow. Um, to get, because you were bringing up with one of the callers about your experience in Atlanta and, and how that seemed to be even worse. Um, I thought that was super important. I lived in Atlanta for a while and, and you talked about how Atlanta uh, was, I'm just read from the book, Atlanta was supposed to be the black Mecca in quotes of the South. Then why were there no black females, first line, front line, supervisory, customs, inspectors at all when I arrived in July of 1994. There had been a few black male supervisors, but they by no means called the shots. Atlanta only got their first female supervisor who was white in October 1996 
after the October 1995 reorganization of the agency. Even the Port of El Paso had two female supervisors long before the Port of Atlanta. Atlanta had managed to keep progress out of the port for years. The place was so backward, my friend once stated he looked for dinosaurs to walk through the International Airport terminal where he worked. Um, real important, I thought, because Atlanta, I think, is known to have, you know, explosive, huge black population. And a lot of people get confused and think black people are in charge and calling the shots. And you kind of start things off by saying, no, that was not the case uh, at the Atlanta port. Uh, can you talk about uh, because there were some white female customs inspectors who worked there? Can you talk about how you were treated by your white female co-workers? Well, when I first got to Atlanta, you know, again, my goal was to move up the chain of command and be a great supervisor because I knew I could have did a great job. But when I got to Atlanta, I had all the seniority. I was a senior customs inspector. I had worked on the border, so I had border experience. I had airport experience in Miami. I had seaport experience in Miami. So I had all the great qualifications I needed to be a supervisor. But when I got there... White women freaked out. They said, who is this woman? Now, one month before I got there, three other black females had also got there. We were the first group of black female custom inspectors that actually came into the job. And by the time I got there, they all had already filed EEO complaints. They had already been called all kind of names. I mean, they were just calling us names. It got so bad that we actually we had to actually call a meeting a meeting between black females and white females to try to calm the situation down. Wow. Uh, I just, I, we try to stay G-rated and, and not use a lot of profanity and what have you, but I think it's just important so people uh, get a grasp of what was being said. Uh, you wrote in the book that these white females were calling you all whores, bitches, uh, even nigger. Is that accurate? Yes, in front of passengers. Wow. If you recall when, when this, I guess, meeting was organized, what was said, what was suggested to try to, to resolve this tension? Well, yes, we had a meeting between black females and white females, and actually we should never have had the meeting because things got much worse after the meeting. Uh, you know, I didn't call the meeting, and the girl who called the meeting, you know, we told her she should have never called the meeting because after the meeting, the name calling got even worse. And I don't think it ever really calmed down the whole time I was there in Atlanta. George. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Thursday, June 29th, 2017. So I have been told this is our weekly Thursday workplace racism broadcast. Uh, if you are a particularly if you are a black entrepreneur, as they say, dial in. Share your experience being self-employed. Uh, if you have figured out what to do so that you don't have problems on the job, you get all your promotions, you get your raise, you get whatever office you want. If you need to transfer to a different department, you get it with no problems. We need to hear from you immediately. You should be the first person to call in if you figure that out and have a codified list of what to do, what not to do, so that other black people can replicate your marvelous Workplace success. Uh, the number to call in 641 715 3640. The code 564 943 pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. The number again 641 715. Three six four zero, the code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Again, this is not a broadcast for spectators. Okay, just want to make sure. Remind folks, uh, Doctor Welsing, 
always great to mention, get her uh, presence with the broadcast. But she used to say, you know, it should be impossible to get five, six, three black people together uh, and not have like a robust hours long conversation about workplace racism. And one thing that I can tell you, having hosted this broadcast for eight and a half years now, over that time period, uh, I don't Talking to non-white people, victims of white supremacy all over the world. When I talk to people off the air, workplace racism comes up every time. It does not matter how old the person is, male, female. They can be in the States, different part of the world. Workplace racism comes up where people have lengthy discussions, either thinking about th- thinking about things that have happened to them, things that are happening to them now. Uh, whether it's something that happened to them directly or just things that they've observed. Uh, People are seeing all kinds of things. So I definitely think it's helpful to share, particularly if you want to kind of reflect on your work history. I do that myself. Times when you maybe were a little more confused about racism and you can think about uh, how you processed certain situations, then what you did, what you said and what you would do now. Uh, with the information that you have about racism, I think that can be very helpful. But certainly, I think being able to share uh, in terms of our experiences and if we figured out some things that work well or things that did not work well, I think that it can be very helpful uh, to share those on this sort of platform. Uh, just it helps us to see patterns. Uh, and particularly if you figured out some things that work, we need codified counter racist suggestions for the workplace that are proven to work so if you got that definitely share uh quickly the audio segment we heard at the beginning uh that was kathy harris she's been a guest on the program back in 2013 we discussed her book uh the kathy a uh, kathy harris story a lot of that is about workplace racism uh with her time working uh for tsa i think at the time it was part of uh, homeland security uh but you heard and I mean that was the bulk of the broadcast talking about things that were happening on the job Uh, you heard uh, either on her job with TSA I'm seeing workplace racism where the whites I can see how they are mistreating the black people that come through and then I'm seeing what they're doing to other employees not hiring black supervisors and what have you I was cracking up laughing even though it is serious where she said at the end uh, that this meeting was called by another black female employee to try to ease tension uh, between the white and uh, the white female workers and the black female workers and the meeting just made it worse uh, that I am not surprised uh, the treachery uh, of white women workers not shocking at all you can go back in the archives if you want to hear the the full broadcast Uh, you can get her book as well she's written several books about her uh, experience the racism and the abuse that she encountered on the job she even had great suggestions uh, because she talked so much about sexual abuse on the job she had great suggestions as well as uh, in terms of it happening to her how she dealt with it and recommend recommendations that she gives now uh, in addressing that situation next up a lot of people wrote in you can always write uh, if you uh, are not able to participate if you just want to share suggestions or thoughts on things that you know you hear through the broadcast uh, or if you have your own situation that you want to uh, discuss you can email until justice at gmail.com until justice at gmail.com but yeah drop us a line and uh, we will read your commentary uh, on the air if you're so interested uh, I have uh, I guess a proposal I have my the next report that I'm writing uh, for Atlanta Black Star. It is about uh, difficulties black male teachers experience. Uh, We talked about this subject specifically before Uh, we had Professor Travis uh, Nichols on the program. He's at Stanford uh, where he looked at the work where black male teachers constitute the smallest demographic of educators uh, in the U.S. And it's getting smaller Uh, specifically because of racism. Some of this came up when Dr. Curry was was with us. Uh, And this is workplace racism right on time. If we have any black male educators, if you would like to share uh, your experience and possibly have it included in this uh, report, Drop me an email until justice at gmail dot com. We can probably talk offline and go over, you know, some of your details, whatever it is you would like to say about your experience being a black male teacher on the difficulties that you face or challenges. And uh, yeah, because I've heard from uh, black male teachers uh, on workplace racism and throughout the years. So if you would like to share, feel free. Um, I guess this is, you know, serious journalism. So generally 
would be great if you want to go on record with a name, but I, I certainly understand and acknowledge the danger of doing that. So uh, if we could maybe compromise by at minimum being able to say uh, black male teacher in, I'll just pick uh, Seattle, Washington, right? If we could at least do a region, right? Which if you're in the Seattle public school system uh, or the Atlanta public school system, if we could do it like that, and then I can, you know, put in, it should be obvious, you know, why you might not want to be identified specifically, but at least where you are and then whatever you'd like to share until justice at gmail.com. If we have black male teachers who would like uh, their commentary or thoughts considered to be included in the piece. Uh, with that, uh, we have folks uh, who wrote in as well. I will see if uh, Stacy is with us in the UK, so you might hear a ring in the background. Uh, we had a lot of different people who wrote in with regards to workplace racism, so I will read one or two and then get to the callers. Uh, some of the folks, uh, one person who wrote in, uh, black male, uh, he says, uh, He's called before. Curtis again. I'm sharing this because I find it ironic that after sharing a workplace racism report on the June 8th broadcast that was shared to me by an Ethiopian casino worker friend of mine, it happened again to another friend this week. I was driving with another female friend of mine, a non-white black Ethiopian woman, and without me sharing this prior story I had, she brought up workplace racism in conversation. She works in the timeshare business where they recruit couples and then qualify them to receive free Las Vegas stage shows, dinners, etc. in exchange for sitting through a timeshare proposal, which lasts typically an hour. A street recruiter sent her the qualified a street recruiter sent her the qualifier, an older white couple, man and woman, after qualifying them as married and getting them the free Las Vegas stage show dinner proposition for going to a timeshare meeting. The husband began asking her questions. White male. Where are you from? Ethiopian female. Ethiopia. White male. Oh, why are you not skinny? Ethiopian female. What do you mean by that? White female wife interrupts. Oh, he is just means he has traveled the world. He is ex-military and has been all over the world and seen many different groups of people. Ethiopian female tells me she was trying to save her husband. Ethiopian female responds. Uh oh, I know what you mean. You're trying to say all Ethiopians are supposed to be skinny. Things that were shown on TV. Well, you know, that is just not something to happen to Ethiopians. It happens in America as well, where people are looking for means to eat. That was about as much dialogue as I could get about the situation. She told me she was angry and furious with the racist white ex-military man and subliminally suggested he may be poor, cheap, hungry like those non-white black people he was speaking about because of him mentioning he only agreed to do the timeshare tour in exchange with the free perks. After the couple got their perks, the situation was over. I suggested to her, based on information I got on the cows, not to let her emotions take over when dealing with racist whites. Instead, expect it and be prepared to counter it, come to a conclusion. I shared with her information Gus gave this month about asking questions. When the white man asked why she was not skinny, she should have asked him immediately if he was white. After getting his answer of yes, she should have told him that sounds like something a racist would say and then proceeded to tell the couple about the free perks and wonderful benefits about the timeshare and move to the new customer. She felt a confidence in standing up to the racist by standing up for herself by suggesting the racist was possibly poor, cheap like the skinny Ethiopians he remembered for admitting he is only doing it for free perks. I suggested she adopt a more codified response such as asking questions and carrying on business as usual. Doing so could only result in the racist accusing her of being unprofessional, risking her employment. Definitely, you do not want to be emotional uh, at all. Uh, and I'm always an advocate of questions. Ask questions. Ask questions. Um, certainly, that is something that you can say. I've suggested that one as well on the job. She told uh that sounds like something a racist would say and leave it at that. Uh, that's one of the few times if there is a statement, if someone says something that's really they make a racist joke or anything that's just clearly racist, there's not going to be any problem. If anybody 
else hears that this was said, this is, you know, not disputed, whatever the person said or did was racist. That is certainly one that you can uh, you can use if you some people might not feel comfortable with that uh, because the white person, sometimes they might try and spin it and say, oh, you called me a racist, which you did not. If you don't feel comfortable with that, you can even put that in the form of a question. They say they're white. Are you a racist question (laughs) and see what they say? So you got you got options with how you want to deal with that one. I uh, got other people that wrote in, but I will uh, go ahead and get to the callers. Uh, the number again is 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to participate. Great job uh, sharing counter-racist suggestions. Workplace counter racist suggestions with other black people that is phenomenal if that was something that we were doing on a regular basis woo, we would be making astronomical progress towards solving this problem immediately uh, folks who uh, dialed in with a hand up uh, if you have commentary you would like to share line should be open uh, feel free Let's see. Uh, I know retired firefighter. Uh, did you have a uh, commentary you were going to share, sir? Uh, not right now. I'm not not in good place, and uh, I have to uh, travel to the grocery store. Oh, I see. I don't want to. Uh, I'll, I'll chime. I'll, I'll chime in 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 a reaction if something based on my experiences in the, in my uh, time at work that I can share with someone that may can help them. Right on. I will. Appreciate that. The uh, person retired should not be the first one called again. The spectating again for workplace racism. Uh, Some of the people that wrote in this week, we did have a lot of folks who uh, wrote in in advance. They were piling them up a little bit. I will share uh, as people uh, are spectating listening in for their Thursday. I know, I guess, uh, since it's summertime, a lot of the typical Thursday amusements are not available. Uh, if you were into watching uh, basketball or Shonda Rhimes, thank goodness it's Thursday, all the stuff, Grey's Anatomy and everything that comes on uh, on Thursday night is gone for the summertime. So if people are having to make do and figure out whatever it is, spectating or just hanging out should not be it. Uh, the Workplace Racism Broadcast, I think, uh, if you have a job... You definitely should have a thing or two to share uh, things you've seen. But folks who wrote in. uh, Okay. Person said, I'm currently working a sports camp. Uh, It's black male, by the way, where I teach. We are all working with a partner. I noticed that I was paired up with a white woman and I knew that I would have to cancel her out in my head and plan as if I was working alone. Sure enough, on the first day of camp, she says, I didn't plan anything. I was hoping you had something planned. I was not surprised. That is gold. A plus counter racist work. When a white person, when they practice racism on the job, when they do something tacky, whatever it is, when they do it and your response is, I was not surprised. In fact, I thought Becky was going to do something like this. I thought Ted was going to do exactly that. And in fact, i had been planning for them to do that. So I was already prepared. It was not a big deal because this is exactly what I thought they were going to do to begin with. That, again, make an astronomical progress towards solving this problem. If, if that's the position that we can be in more frequently, then I was upset. I can't believe they did this. It's 2017. I can't believe... Man, <laughs> we've been... That's the general line of thinking that we've had for the last... 300, 400 years of this. Way too many of us. Continuing. I was not surprised. I just said, yes, I do actually have a plan. So far, she has done absolutely nothing. She does not engage with the camp children at all, doesn't smile, and often disappears. The other day, she left 40 minutes early, and I escorted the students to the cafeteria myself and found her sitting down, 
relaxing while using her phone. I am taking notes on this, but my suspected racist supervisor has a great relationship with her, so I am in limbo. Now, this is one, this is why I said when I hear all that about uh, meritocracy, as they call it, and pull yourself up uh, by your bootstraps, even here, you know, victims who think that this is true, that, you know, white people just work really hard and black people are just shiftless and lazy and, and, and don't want to have any personal responsibility to take care of themselves. Man, oh man, nothing could be further from the truth. You want to talk about shiftless and lazy. Man, the system of white supremacy, white people, it is amazing. Uh, We have talked about that. That almost has been uh, one of the cliches for workplace racism in terms of things that people are reporting that have been major problems for them on the job uh, in terms of white people not even doing their job. They're loafing so hard that it's causing other people problems where you're having a bottleneck in productivity because this white person is just sitting up with their feet uh, on the desk. I have seen that repeatedly. Uh, You all have reported it widespread in the system uh, of white supremacy. And if if she has or you all have a uh, white supervisor, I'm sure this white person is not ignorant uh, about this loafing white chick who's not taking care of the children. I mean, you know, anything could have happened. A pedophile, Jerry Sandusky, could have come through and, you know, run off with all the children. She doesn't know. She's on the phone doing doing whatever. Seeing that we hear about that on a weekly basis, I don't know if you reporting this would necessarily, or even I guess if I'm thinking about it, you could perhaps ask questions uh, about breaks. You get, again, I keep going back. When all else fails, try to think of questions that can ask to address a situation. If you get stumped and you really can't think about how to proceed to move forward, think of a question. Cause I mean, that's where you're at. You have a question about how to proceed. Think of a question that you, a legitimate question that's not going to get you in trouble. That's not just for rhetoric purpose, but a legitimate question about a problem that's happening. And uh, with this, if, if there is a time and I mean, anything that's dealing with, with children, like, you know, that's the type of thing I try to be very, uh, cautious about because I've seen a lot of situations where parents can get really uh, worked up about their children. I don't know if there are white children involved in this, but that can be a really dangerous situation uh, if something happens and you know they want to say that you're responsible for little Johnny. You know something happening to him, or what, like I said, Jerry Sandusky can appear from time to time. Uh, so I would maybe even think about asking a question: uh, Do we get phone breaks? How many phone breaks? That might be one to go with. How many phone breaks are we allowed? You know. Um, if such and I think such and such the other day, she took a little break away to use her phone. That's fine. I'm just trying to see how many breaks, you know, we get to take, uh, to use our phone during the day. Do we get a five minute break in the morning? Do we get a 10 minute break? Something like that. Just, you know, to go kind of recharge our battery. You can think of a question. I'm sure there are other better questions even, uh, that could be asked, uh, in that situation. And again, not with the thinking that white people are going to do right, but it can just, Hey, Let's ask a question to see if that might motivate this white woman to get everybody working hard here. Uh, We got these children. We should try to be professional about this. This is not exactly a brain surgery type of job that we're doing, but we do have other people's children that we're supposed to keep an eye on as opposed to be, you know, playing on our iPhone or whatever we're doing uh, for the afternoon. You know, let's let's focus it. It might at least help with that. I would at least appreciate another pair of eyes. Uh, Not that I'm expecting her to, to get her act together and be super counselor, not race soldier. But uh, at least to see if uh, you can help with the situation, maybe think of a question or two that you could ask. Uh, We'll see if other folks have anything they would add there as well. Uh, Other folks uh, wrote in. uh, Let me make sure. Stacy, are you with us? Stacy in London, are you uh, with us? I got everyone here. Oh, great. Great to hear you. Good to hear from you. Good to hear from you. Did you? Sorry, I was being quiet. Right on. Not no worries. Just making sure that you uh, were with us. Did you want to take a moment to uh, get acclimated before you uh, share? Yeah. Can you give me about five ten minutes? Sure. Sure. Uh, no, yes, ma'am. Uh, we had one of the other folks uh, who wrote in. Uh, he says, uh, "My company celebrates all popular." events and holidays. A tradition they are doing now is getting props for that holiday and getting employees to take pictures with them in order to celebrate that event and post on the company's version of the Facebook app or print the executive bulletin board decorations. I have gained the reputation of being the person who does not participate in group pictures or holiday activities. 
So when they ask me to it becomes a joke among my coworkers to try to see if they can get me this time. It happened today. One of the females said it's just an American flag. Come join the picture. I declined and to prevent them from continuing to ask me, I offered to be the cameraman and take the picture for them. Awesome. I attached the photo. I don't like to spend time explaining to white people why I don't celebrate the holidays like the 4th of July. My excuse is I don't, I don't wear, uh, I don't like to take pictures, excuse me, uh, when non-white black co-workers ask why I break it down. And then he has the uh, photo that he took where it looks like they did uh, dupe some victims uh, into joining the photograph to celebrate. I totally forgot the fourth. I am so disconnected from uh, the 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 whole holiday ritual, and I tend to associate just with the like end of the year holidays, you know, Christmas and all the big ones where people go really wacky. But I guess Fourth of July is coming. Uh, I know I have been on jobs before where they do like picnics and uh, I don't know little company type gatherings and things for. Uh, the 4th of July, if you all are doing that sort of thing, if it's mandatory, same thing that we talk about when they do this for Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the stuff at the end of the year, I would already have my plan. Of course, it's going to be no alcohol. Uh, I would already know in advance how long I'm going to stay, and I would already have a plan in advance about who I'm going to go with. Uh, I would try not to go by myself. We talked about this before uh, with a spouse, what have you, or if you have a codified uh, colleague, at least a non-white colleague that you can tolerate, you all can hang out, kind of protect each other, keep an eye out for each other for you know the 45 minutes or whatever if you have to attend. But if it's not mandatory... I have got things to do. It's so busy. The children are out of school this summer, and I don't know which way is up or down. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it in the road as best I can. So, no, I, I just won't be able to participate, but I hope it's great. I hope it's great weather and, you know, have fun for me. Leave it at that. <laughs> but great job and great job getting out of the photo uh, photo uh, to the caller who uh, wrote in uh, offering to take the picture as a means of getting out. Bravo. Bravo. Job well done. Uh, check in to see if uh, folks are still spectating uh, or hanging out. Uh, the caller is 7720-7720. Did you have a uh, commentary you want to share? You should be with us. Hey, how you doing, Gus? <clears throat> Greetings to you. Greetings to the callers. Um, I'm not in a good place right now. This is The Voice 305. Oh, I just wanted to um, really um, chime in on what the last caller wrote in. Uh, my, my code is that on July, 4th of July, and New Year's Eve, because I live in a predominantly uh, area where I'm around a lot of folks that crime tends to happen. I tell all my friends, like, those are the two times a year that you try your best not to go anywhere. Even some of my um, friends that do go and visit church, I tell them not even to travel on the road because a lot of those two times are the perfect two times that anybody wants to go out and assassinate somebody. It's harder for you to get found on those two days because a lot of times people think fireworks is gunshots, you know, and gunshots fireworks. So you, they, it's hard for them to decipher the two. So I just really wanted to, um, you know, implement that, like, those two days, especially for us black people, to stay in the house as much as possible. Those are the two most dangerous days for us, period. And I... I'll mute my line and I'll chime in later when I'm in a safe environment. Right on, right on. Absolutely. Uh, remain codified throughout the summer. Stay safe for uh, for folks out there. Uh, like I said, on the job, if you if you have to work, uh, I would be safe that day. And I guess I would be mindful because even if you whether you have to work or you don't have to work, that is a holiday that whites definitely encourage and celebrate a lot of binge drinking. So I would just be mindful of that. Uh, probably uh, this weekend since uh, the July 1st will start, I think, Saturday. Uh, it might be one of those where they start partying on the weekend and it just carries all the way over to the 4th. I think that's Tuesday. Um, so just be mindful of uh, that, that there could be a lot of uh, intoxicated whites and unfortunately a lot of intoxicated victims uh, on the road from probably Saturday uh, through the middle of the week. Just be mindful uh, of that. If you're out and about, maybe remind folks, remind other black people uh, if they're motorists that uh, might be a lot of intoxicated folks out there. So be mindful. You might have to do a little bit more defensive driving. Uh, see if other folks uh, 
are still spectating. Uh, they uh, could, if this is a symbol that Cavs listeners again are doing great and they're not having issues or anything to report on the job, fantastic. You should certainly invest. Racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com. Racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com. Listener supported counter racist radio. PayPal is in the top right corner. If you're not in the PayPal, drop us an email. We'll get you the physical mailing address. Uh, but again, I always give a curious uh, look uh, when I see a, a significant number of black people, uh, anything double digits and up uh, and black people crickets when it gets to workplace racism. Uh, I look askew uh, a little bit and wonder if, you know, people are being true. But again, I, it's it's not as fun, certainly. Uh, I know it's a lot more entertaining to talk about entertainment and that sort of thing, uh, or even what Donald Trump is up to, as opposed to how uh, we get abused and mistreated uh, on the job. But I do think it's very important. So many of us spend time there on a regular basis and have all types of just horrendous things, sexual abuse and all the other things that they do, uh, obstructing our ability to be compensated correctly uh, obstructing our ability to get time off, even if we have deaths in the family uh, making it difficult for us to get time off to pay our respects uh, if someone should transition hope not but uh, just all the things that they do to us I definitely think it's something that's serious we should be thinking about we should be writing about and talking about uh, number again 641-715-3640 and the code 564-943-POUND Press star six if you would like to participate while folks are maybe thinking of what they will share with workplace racism. Other folks who wrote in. Uh, this is black male. Uh, he said, thanks for having a program to discuss this important topic. I'm unable to call because I'll be on the plantation at that time. On a previous broadcast, a caller observed that racist suspects on the job are curious about their victims, parents. Here in St. Louis, I've observed on my plantation that the racist suspects are very interested in the romantic partners of non-white people. So much that when times for promotions come around, the only black males that get chosen just so happen to have white female partners. Cowbell. Even when they have much less knowledge and experience, could it be because they fit in with them socially or perhaps are more comfortable being racially showcased. Has anyone else in the call seen this before? I am confused. Um, I certainly think there are a large number of non-white people uh, who, in fact, I'll even <laughs> start over with my response. Starting over with my response, I would say I think racists, they I've seen where they can kind of do whatever they want. Sometimes they will punish a non-white person. Uh, if it's a black male and he's in some sort of tragic arrangement uh, with a white woman, sometimes it will be, we'll punish uh, that person. In fact, people who watch football, uh, college football specifically, Mac Strong, he was uh, the former uh, head coach at the University of Texas. He said before he took that, I think he, he just got let go recently, but he was head coach there for a few years. Before he took that job, or right when he got hired for that job, there was a major story, I think this is on NPR, where he said he did not get head coaching jobs, NCAA head coaching jobs, even though people knew he was a good coach and he had been like an assistant coach on national championship teams. He didn't get hired for jobs because he's married to a white woman. So they can, I've, and I've heard this with other people where they felt like they were being punished. They were not getting jobs. They were not getting hired or they were being uh, explicitly attacked because they were in a tragic arrangement. So they could do it either way. That could be the situation uh, that's happening on your plantation. If that's the pattern that you've picked out where the race soldiers there might say, well, hey, the way that we want to run ours, the ones that are in a tragic arrangement, we already know uh, that it'll be easy to manipulate and use them. So we'll go that route. That could be the way that they run it. Sometimes that's the way that they, they do it. The, in my view, the most important thing to remember is that race soldiers Racist man, racist woman, they're the ones that are in charge. Um, in terms of the curiosity uh, about black people and their partners, uh, I think that's a part of it. I think we've had a lot of people on the program over the years who've shared that. Uh, the white people trying to be nosy if you're single, 
are you dating anybody? And sometimes they try to be matchmaker about it. And, you know, I know somebody we can hook you up with or see if they can find another black uh, person in the building. Right. I've heard that before. If they hire another black person who's of the opposite sex, be like, oh, yeah, you know, you got to talk to, you know, such and such. We're going to put hook you all up, see if we can get you out on a date. If you're married, then how many children do you have? How long have you been married? Lots of that. And I think we've even had conversations before. If you're not comfortable getting into all of that, Try to minimize as much detail as possible. That's my general recommendation is you're not paid. That's not a part of your job duty to come there to just gossip about your family and friends and dating life and whatever you're doing uh, in your social time away from work. That's not what you're being paid for. So I'm a big advocate of minimize all of that. Uh, They just are trying to get more information so they can use it against you. Uh, Just think of it as they have a dossier on you and they're just trying to gather information. So I'm a big advocate of, no, I'm not, I'm not here to give up any information about my dating life. If I'm single, who I'm dating, any of that, I'm married, talking about my spouse. That's why I've said before, not to have uh, pictures or any of that. So I would try to minimize that uh, as much as I can. And uh, just, you know, I think Raz has said it before, just being frank about that, that, you know, I'm just not a big talker and just try to be about uh, my business. I don't really go into a whole lot of personal stuff and, and getting into a whole lot of gossip. I've just seen where that can waste a lot of time. People talking about, you know, a whole lot of stuff that doesn't have to do with work. I'm already behind. Let's get back to it. Um, let's see, make sure, because it looked like there were a lot of questions. Um, I guess he asked if anyone else has uh, has seen this. As I said, that's my view. I think I've seen it both ways. If, if folks have any thoughts on that, uh, I guess feel free since uh, that seemed to be the question that was asked. Uh, folks wanted to uh, respond to his email. Uh, folks had any other comments they wanted to share. Feel free. Hi, Gus. Stacy in London. Yes, ma'am. All right. Just in terms of that. Um, sorry, can you hear me properly? Yes, ma'am. Um, in terms of that last written um, report, um, I think I would definitely say in my experience, both in my current organisation and in the past, it is a way of identifying who can be, or at least who is perceived to be easily manipulated. And um, definitely in my experience, they are the people who are more easily manipulated than they have uh, white partners, so they do tend to be promoted. Uh, um, so that would definitely um, be how I would perceive that. And I do think um, it is a strategy. I don't think it's accidental at all. Um, am I right to give my some of my updates, Gus? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, okay. Um, last week I did um, talk about fact that my director had um, physically assaulted me in the workplace and just for people who may not have heard that program she over a period of years has basically walked so hard towards me on on four occasions now um and, um, you know, in a really aggressive way that in order to avoid collision, I've had to move out of the way. And that behaviour is not isolated to just her being, um, you know, that aggressive. She's shown her contempt in other ways. But last week it resulted in an actual collision because I was taking something out of a microwave and therefore... Um, move out of the way but there was no reason for her to a walk into me and certainly if she did and that was an accidental um, occurrence for her not to acknowledge that it happened and apologize which she did not so um i had a meeting on monday with um the, the, one of the group directors he is her line manager and he is also overall so um had about an hour's meeting with him he um he listened um at the end of it asked me what i wanted to do so i i questioned him i said does the organization have a policy on matters because i, I didn't say this to him but as far as i'm concerned this is some you know aggression 
in any you know most organizations have a policy on aggression and it usually results in gross misconduct um so um he responded that he could handle it in two ways i could either um choose to go down an informal route and he could have a conversation with her and i'd also made him aware of things going going on in my team with my head of team other colleagues in my team um, and also um, line managers and, and um, even you know, people that come into the organisation from time to time um, including the, the girl who I'm in so, asked me to um, so he said I could choose to handle those situations informally by him speaking to them. So I said, uh, if it's formal, does that mean there's a record of it? And so I said, well, no, it wouldn't be a record. But however, if I want him to have a record of it, then he, he could look at that. And then the alternative is um, the formal routes. He actually did say, and, and, and I guess it's true to say, you know, that if you go down the grievance route, um it, it will be difficult in terms of you know the whole kind of having to go through that process um and that um you know it, it basically he didn't quite say it like this but he said you know if you lose you know if you get nasty either way and i wanted to at that point in this meeting say you are responsible for staffing in this organization and you're here telling me it could get nasty. Now, at the end of the day, I know that both with my head of team and with the director, there have been several complaints about them. Not one, not two, and certainly in the case of my director, not even ten, more than that, uh, including her being found guilty of racism. So I really don't understand why he would be told. Well, I do understand, but you know, I was like, you're actually telling me it could get nasty rather than making sure that it doesn't get nasty. But I didn't obviously say that because um, I need to manage the meeting. Make sure that, you know, not that he's necessarily on side, but that I don't become an issue for him. So that was the end of that. Uh, sorry, the upshot being that I have said I will come back to him and let him know how I want to proceed. There were a couple of things that got said in that meeting um, that you know to do with how I might want to proceed in general um, so I said I'd get back to him by tomorrow um, but I mean, in fact I might get back to him on Monday but that's for um, various reasons um, now my manager so last week when I contacted the chief uh, sorry the, the, the group director I had also, I think I had taken a day off because of the fact that the um, racist director had walked into me and it was just too upsetting. So I emailed my head of team and line manager and informed them that I was working from home. Sorry, I was, I was taking the day of sick. There was an incident and now the matter had been escalated. Now, just to give some broader context, my i've got an interim line manager at the moment who is a racist soldier and i have made complaints about her over several years and as um, i'm sure she's doing the of the head of the director they don't do anything about it and they're dismissing what i'm saying now um in january my previous line manager was um basically given um, a pay rise that she doesn't deserve uh, and, and um, uh, promotion that into a job that she's not capable of doing so the person then who there's another male in my team he was appointed in that role power to it so they put in an interim arrangement which is just a, a veiled way of trying to do a restructure without going through a formal process and um, asked me on a temporary basis to report to this racist female. I had reservations, but I wanted to seem like I was willing to support the team, so I agreed to it, and that should have ended at the end of May. 
End of May rolled around, didn't hear anything. But back in March, um, sorry, no, it was probably in February, I emailed my head of team and I said, I wanted to discuss this racist um, interim manager um, because of uh, issues coming up. Uh, and, and so I raised the matter with my um, head of team and this was in a meeting work couple of other issues were discussed, including um, accusations from um, another member in the team who I've mentioned, and I'll come to that a bit later, but I've mentioned on previous um, programmes. And uh, she had, I had told her in detail, you know, what my concerns were, but in, not, in, not in depth, but it gave her an overview. Um, and Obviously, she's protecting her, so she said, oh, um, well, we don't have enough time to go into it now. Let's put another date in the diary to go through it. And I said, fine. And I summarised the meeting, and I deliberately did not go into a lot of detail in the correspondence on that matter, because I knew they were just going to use it to um, cover their tracks. So, um, at the end of May, as I said, this interim arrangement should have come to an end. Um... And um, in between that, comp that first coffee team and um, the end of May, um, I'd had meetings and she had with my head of team and she was basically saying that I didn't tell her what the situation was, which was a blatant lie. And so we went into the tennis match correspondence with, on email saying, uh, yes, I did. And she's saying, no, I didn't. So... Um, I essentially said, look, I've raised concerns with you about her behaviour and her treatment towards me. It's not even the first time. Either way, it was an interim arrangement. It's come to an end. What is happening? This male who was appointed in the role should naturally be taken over, regardless of whether I'd raised concerns or not. Um, so at that point, she said, well, I'm this interim arrangement because other things are going on in the organisation, so she can't um, uh, she can't make changes at the moment. So I then raised the matter with HR, who basically gave me the fob off. So this was one of the issues that I raised with the group director. Um, and so when I took time off last week, I didn't tell her specifically what my director had done, i.e. had knocked into me. But I said there was an incident and that I was going to take time off because, uh, and also that the matter had been escalated. Well, all of a sudden, she wants to know what's going on. She is so concerned about me. Can I call her on my mobile, on her mobile? Because she was working at home that day. But I'd logged out, because I'd, I'd emailed in remotely anyway, so I just ignored her. Well, in fact, I didn't see the correspondence until the following day. Um, and ever since, she's just been trying so hard to speak to me, because, you know, she's really concerned um, um, basically she wants to know because I haven't told her what, what exactly it is and obviously she doesn't know what escalation means because it could mean several things in the organisation um, but it's just you know the way in which they are able to change and smile and be caring and sensitive and if we're really foolish we will fall for it um, Gus, I have another a couple of other updates, but I'm going to stop speaking for a while, so I'm going to pause there. Wow, uh, I made uh notes. Uh, the first one, maybe the most important one, taking a day off. I remember last, I think it was last week, when you said when you gave us the update on this uh race soldier who had been. Uh, assaulting you on the job, coming down the hallway and uh, bumping you uh, most recently and you literally having to dodge her uh, to avoid, you know, being bowled over by her in the hall on a regular basis. Uh, you said you were taking some time off to just kind of recruit those mental health days uh, are so important. Uh, racism, white supremacy. I mean, it's just a, a constant assault uh, on us and it's so important uh, to make time uh, to repair, to recharge. Uh, we've recommended it to other people on the job. I've recommended it for myself. Uh, it's really, really important. It's something that I wish I had known 
at the beginning of my work career, when you feel yourself, when you've had direct abuse and you've had a tough time, go ahead and, and use some of those days. I know for myself, sometimes they would give us uh, personal days. Uh, you would get like a few of those in addition to your like sick leave and whatever else. And if you didn't use the personal days, you would lose them. Uh, and so I think it happened to me at least twice. I didn't even use them uh, at the, you know, during the during the full year. So take the, the time for uh, mental health. Very important. With these sort of a rate, like the one you were talking about towards the end, the, the situation where uh, I guess this uh, white woman that you're supposed to report to, this is supposed to just be a temporary thing just for a short period of time. And then, you know, moving moving back to, to how things are supposed to run. And now they're saying, well, wait a minute, we got other things going in the organization and, you know, we can't do it. I know you have concerns, but you'll just have to be patient like that sort of thing. I think whites, they are very good uh, at that. Explaining something at first that you and I think you said you had reservations immediately uh, about this situation where it's something where it looks like this might be a problem for you or this is this is not going to be something that's out, working out in your best interest. Uh, where they'll try and sell it like, oh, this is going to work out for everybody and, you know, be a p- team player. Come on, Stacy, work with us. And it's just going to be for a short period. And then the short period, this is permanent. Now this is the way it's going to be for the rest of the time that you're here. I've seen that sort of thing exactly uh, there. So, de- so I say that all the time, master deceivers. You really have to keep that sort of thing uh, in mind with white people that a lot of times they, uh, they renege. Uh, they do not stick to what they originally say, uh, particularly uh, in a situation where it's going to be to your disadvantage uh, if they do not honor uh, their original commitment. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, I guess we'll have other updates uh, coming as well. Um, other folks, if you are with us, if you have commentary, you want to share either uh, the situation happening with Stacy. If you have your own situation, you want to share as well. Uh, feel free. Uh, the caller uh, 7080 7080. Did you have commentary? You should be with us. Yes, greetings, Matt. You heard? Yes, sir. Yes, greetings to you, Gus, and greetings to all the other Cal listeners. Um, I'm a black male, first time caller, calling from the area known as Houston, Texas. And I wanted to uh, share workplace racism. I work for a a very large chemical company, and uh, one of the distinct ways that they practice racism, they're very refined where I work at. when I graduated in 2012, uh, me and a white girl graduated at the same time, and they, they did the party. We both graduated from the same university, University of Houston. The only difference, she, she the, the white female graduated with a degree in civil engineering. I graduated with a degree in supply chain management, and we both work in the purchasing department. And so my skill set is well covered under my degree plan as well as hers. The difference is neither one of us asked for any promotion or anything. I was, you know, called in and offered a promotion. The difference in promotions, the white girl, we were both in indefinite contracts where we worked long-term as contractors. She was invited into the company as a direct employee, and I was still kept as a contractor but moved to a a higher position. We both moved to a higher position. Her position was more of a strategic position. My position was more of a transactional, tactical type of position. So after I thought about that, I said, well, you know, what's the, what are the differences, you know, in our work? And so after I pondered on that, I said, oh, this is a, a, di- a distinct way of them practicing races. And they're very refined in who they invite into the company. And, uh, and who they let come in and, and the type of positions that they they actually offer to um, non-like people. Uh, one of the other things is um, the, the, the word coordinator. What I noticed, one of the observations I noticed is people who tend to get the titles coordinators, because I have now moved to like a project coordinator, a lot of non-white people <laughs> occupy the coordinator position, which generally gives you a lot of work. You're, you're generally managing a lot of uh, projects at the same time, whereas the white people will get the strategic position. So I, I get the coordinator. They get the actual strategic position, sourcing specialist, whatever that is. And the difference is you're looking at about a $20,000 difference in pay. So that's a, a a definite way that 
whites actually practice racism on their job was how they position black people on the jobs and also also um, how they invite blacks to come into the company. So that's that's what I'll share. If I can think of more, I will turn back in. I'm also the, the, the person that emailed about LinkedIn <laughs> and um, setting up a LinkedIn, and uh, I really appreciate the advice that I got on that. So thank you. Thank you for letting me share. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember we've had uh, quite, I guess, a few conversations about LinkedIn uh, at this point, folks, given uh, different commentary. How did you get the, like, the information about the white girl who got the, who's making $20,000 more than you? How did you get her credentials? Did you kind of know her as you all were coming up together through this, or? Yeah, we, yeah, we, well, she worked, she actually worked there a little bit longer than me, and we actually had the, the party, um, do they gave us like a graduation party and I just kind of found out through word of mouth that one of the, the differences direct employees have a different badge so they'll have a red badge and contractors will have a blue badge so immediately you know afterwards I seen that she you know was sporting a red badge and then also I seen what her title changed to so that that was how I, I kind of knew and so now it's, it's four years later and I'm still relatively stuck in the same place you know there's not really any career track or or any talk of promotion it's, it's more or less like um you know <laughs> learn you know basically transactional learn learn sap learn all you can learn there and that's basically where they see you at you know so i i thought of um dr clorkin uh i think it's book color monitors where you know they just really they really you know just have you data pushing you know they're not really interested in your your expert expertise past that. Certainly, but no. Uh, as far as the, I'm sorry. Uh, as far as the the um, pay level, I, I, I we actually found out the pay grade. You know, I think somebody printed their W two. I, I had a good idea what the range was anyway, but generally that position is about ninety thousand, where our position is about seventy thousand, and the. One of the other things that they do too, along with my position, they've added the contract administrator work. But for the blacks, they'll say you're a contract coordinator. Well, for me, they just added me the detail or the duties, the extra duties of being a contract administrator and, and handling all these high dollar invoices. But I haven't got you know that title added to me. I haven't got that pay grade added to me, and that that pay grade is the is um. Uh, it's a little bit higher. It's like a hundred thousand compared to a contract coordinator, where it's like sixty-five, seventy, seventy-five thousand. So it's a it's a big difference. And I guess when you start calculating all that up, it's a uh, it makes a big impact on your personal life. Uh, so I guess the only thing that kind of helped me cope with not being frustrated, not going to work angry, is you know listening to the cows. I've been listening to cows to, for maybe about a year and a half, and that's that has cleared up a lot of confusion to where I kind of at least know the system that I'm, you know, in and why a lot of these things are happening. So that's, that's basically where I'm at. That's why I was asking about LinkedIn because, you know, instead of pouting about it, I want to be prepared to, you know, make my next move. I don't think they'll be at the company that I'm at. Smart, smart, smart. Uh, the reason I asked about the credentials of this uh, white girl who's making twenty thousand uh, dollars more than you is a lot of times white people they try to make it difficult for for us to even get access to that sort of information, uh, so we don't even know that oh this chick is making you know twenty k more than me and you know we got the same credentials or even a lot of times I got better credentials and you know she's racking up she's you know employed she's part of the staff I'm still some. Uh, contractor like she's you know moving right on up past uh, where I'm at and that seems to be standard operating procedure that's why I said in terms of being able to see patterns uh, with these type of jobs if you're hired uh, as some sort of outside contractor where they will just keep dangling it out there like oh yeah you're doing such a great job we're gonna bring you on and you'll get benefits and move right on up they just keep hanging it out and keep hanging out and the weeks go by and months go by and you keep working and working and working and 
never get added to the full-time staff. Like I think Thomas in New York had even shared one where uh, I I think in some areas they have laws because they know that white people will take advantage of workers in this way and just keep hiring you on a contract basis so they don't have to pay you, uh, you know, benefits. And if you get fired, unemployment, all that other stuff, they don't have to do all that. Uh, So if it gets close, like they'll say you can only do this for you can only hire this person uh, as a contractor for maybe 90 days and you have to bring them on full time. If you're going to continue to employ them, they'll let you work for 89 days and then fire you. And then sometimes they'll even bring you back as a contractor and start the whole 90 day process again. But they're ruthless with that sort of thing. Really uh, another one just to be mindful that tends to be the way that whites operate things Uh, did. Other folks, some of the other people that dialed in uh, with a hand up that we haven't heard from have uh, commentary as well, either suggestions. Appreciate that from a first-time caller uh, as well. Glad uh, to hear from you and glad to hear some of the content here uh, has helped you to, to not be as surprised about all this and try to figure out some strategies on what, how to go about updating my uh, my LinkedIn and my resume so that I can you know make some moves and, and try to, to put yourself in a better position. Uh, the person, uh, I think this is Curtis. He's called and written in before. Curtis, uh, did you have a uh, commentary you want to share? You should be with us. Yeah, I want to share something with Gus. Let me get in a better location, though. Yes, sir. Give him uh, a few minutes uh, to, I guess, get settled. Uh, other folks, if you all had commentary you wanted to share, uh, observations on what you've heard from uh, listeners, or if you had your own situation, uh, the number again, six. Four one seven one five three six four zero. The code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, and if uh, you have figured out how to get a raise, we talked about that. Been talking about it for a while. Probably be talking about that one forever. Uh, if you figured out, hey, these are some things that work well to get that raise. Always make sure uh, you share that as well. Uh, definitely needed for victims uh, of racism. Uh, I guess Curtis will let us know when he gets uh, situated to share, do what he needs to do. I guess I would also encourage to make sure that you uh, are professional. I know on this program I've talked consistently about, you know, I think we should strive to be professional counter racist soldiers. And when I say that, meaning just because somebody says something, or is rude to me, Kurt, whatever it is, uh, in a workplace situ- setting or otherwise. I don't, you know, just fly off the handle because they said something and, you know, now we got a brawl or I got to curse them out for the next 10 minutes or whatever it is. Like, I'm professional about things. Um, and I say that even in the work context because things white, uh, whether you have white coworkers or non white coworkers, uh, they will do things to upset you. Uh, maybe purposely, it might be acts of racism if these are white people. You want to make sure that you, you know, train yourself so that you know how you want to respond both immediately and long term. Uh, You know, if they're being rude and curt and what have you, uh, I would say that shouldn't mean that on Tuesday or Wednesday from now on, when you enter the building, whatever folks have done, you don't say hello to anybody. I don't think that's being a professional soldier. I think in the workplace uh, you agree. And I've told non-white people this before off air with people everyone has something to say about workplace racism uh when they were saying that they they would enter the building for work they would say hi to to be like a white person that they see every day works in their department they see this person or working like in the same area with this person regularly and they would be like you know good morning bill let's say his name's bill good morning bill and bill wouldn't speak so, you know, forget it. I'm not even going to speak. And I said, you know, my suggestion, just, you know, as as thinking, using counter racist logic, I already hear from enough people and have experienced it myself where we black people get accused of being aloof or rude or we don't speak, whatever it is. There's already tons of those type of accusations. I'm a big advocate of I'm not going to do anything to add to that narrative. I have no problem speaking. It's not a big deal. This, this is not going to be a 30 minute conversation about the weather and the traffic and what plans you got for the weekend and all that. Just morning. Notice I didn't even put the good on it. Morning. Two syllables. That's it. I don't have to stop walking. You just keep the feet moving. Morning. You can give them the head nod. Morning. Head nod. Whatever it is. Hey. Keep rolling. If they speak, don't speak. Whatever it is. You speak. That's not because, you know, I'm hoping I'm looking for any sort of validation from them. That's not because I want to hug or I want us to be buddies. I want them to invite me to their timeshare later this summer. 
I'm just doing that because that's a part of workplace decorum. Normal people acknowledge the folks that you are in the same building or the same office with 40 hours a week. That's all. <laughs> and hey, at least for the performance review speaks, uh, that will not be one that's listed. Uh, we've had colleagues who say that you're rude because I can totally see how if you if that's the way that you end up responding that, hey, I spoke to this person or I speak and they don't speak back. So now I'm not speaking at all. I could totally see where it gets switched around and it becomes you are the one that's aloof. People say that you're rude. You walk through here and don't speak to anybody and walk through here like we're total strangers and we're a family and all of that. I, morning and keep it pushing. Afternoon, keep it pushing. Evening, keep it. If they say anything, fine. They don't say anything, no problem. They're not my homies anyway. Me saying good morning does not mean I love you and we're going to do our taxes together or anything else. Just workplace, work, uh, workplace courtesy and keep it moving. But I would definitely recommend that big time. Even if someone, you know, really, really upsets you on the job or what have you, that does not mean that you're going to be nasty and rude uh, with them, you know, for the rest of the time that you work there. You just keep it business and keep it consistent. That's one thing I'm a huge advocate of, keeping it consistent. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Curtis, did you need a, a minute or two more to get yourself situated or? Uh, may I be heard? Yes, sir. All right. I was calling today. Uh, didn't even plan on calling, but something happened yesterday. Uh, and this is dealing with uh, black women bringing their children into my work environment, which is, as you guys probably know, the, the women's shoe department. So first I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reminisce to a situation that happened a year ago. It was a, a black woman. Uh, she was uh, shopping with a stroller with a, her son who we found out after the fact had autism, but, you know, he's young enough to be in a stroller, so this young boy, he picks up a shoe, he throws it at an older white lady. You know, she's got to be over 50, 60 years old. So he throws it at her back, you know, and she turns around, and she looks at the boy in the stroller and says, nigger. The lady... She has a friend with her, and, you know, she gets serious. She wants to do something, but the mom understands, you know, the boy has autism, and, you know, she just asks her not to do anything, and she just cries. She just cries it out and doesn't retaliate. So, which brings me, this happened a year ago, so which brings me what happened yesterday at my job. Now, this is something that was told to me, but I saw, like, the video on Snapchat. So I like what's what's going on up there. When I got up there, I got the story. So it's an older white guy who is, it looks like his wife sent him up there to do a return. And I think what he was trying to return was used or something like that. So it, he needed a manager. So there's a customer in line, you know, a lady with a baby, and she's a non-white black female. So both of these people need the same manager. So. The white guy, he's first to line, he gets service first. No problem, no issue. He just, I guess he has an attitude. So while he's being serviced by my manager, the black woman's baby starts crying. So this guy, that's what he's doing. He turns around and he stares at this black baby boy and gives him the nastiest look to the point where the mother has to say, why are you looking at my baby like that? So the guy, the media response is, start cursing, he says, F you and F that baby. And, you know, everyone, I mean, he's saying in a, a loud tone where everyone's stopping what they're doing and they're watching him, like, what's about to happen next. And, he, you know, he's going off on the, the black lady who did nothing but had a, a crying black baby. And it got to the point where my manager says, you know, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the store. And this woman had time to get her cell phone out and start recording him, where at this point, you know, he's balling up his fist, and people think he might even hit her. And pretty much, uh, my manager, she had to call the police. She had the police on the line to the point where the guy didn't even get what he needed done to return and walked out the store and said, F this place, et cetera, et cetera, all because of a crying black baby. So, I mean, I just wanted to share that. Just, uh, I think you said it before. Whenever you go out, you know, you know, people going out in their pajamas, don't don't be casual. It's always something you need to be serious about because 
you never know when you're going to run into these type of people. I mean, you got a guy willing to hit, falling up his fist, so which shows you're willing to hit a, a baby and a woman. In both of these scenarios, no black men were around. So, I mean, I just want to share that. That happened at my job a year, something a year ago, something that happened yesterday. So, if you guys have advice on how to deal with uh, uh, terroristic uh, white people <laughs> out of nowhere when you're not doing anything, I would, I would love to hear it. But that's That's all I had to share. I, I just had uh, my quick question was, since you said this happened on your job twice, it seems over you know the past year, whatever it is, uh, what is their policy? Like if a situation happens like this between, you know, patrons, what are you all supposed to do? Just call the police or what's, what are you supposed to do? Well, the, the first situation, I mean, the baby throws the shoe and the white lady calls the kid a nigger. I, I don't know the policy on that. I mean, I, I would assume you get a manager, and then you go from there. I mean, and if the customer can, you know, deny it or, you know, say, yeah, I said it. And I'm sure they would, you know, that's not tolerated, I don't think. But with this guy, you know, he just he just flipped out. I don't I'm, I don't know the policy, but, I mean, when you're just, you're just going off and going crazy, I mean, my manager called the police, said, sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave or call the police. It got to the point where she actually called the police. The lady called the police. I had a black co-worker, a uh, male, who witnessed it all. He said he walked up just to see if it was going to actually go to that level before he had to uh, intervene, you know, the situation. But I guess by calling the police, the guy left. But cursing out that black baby was more important than getting his return done. You know, his objective was to get something done. But going off on a black lady and the baby was obviously more important to him. Oh, absolute priorities. Priorities. Um, very important. And I think that's important, too, for what you not just the, the pajamas thing being alert, but I think also. And this is just my my observation. I could be error, but it seems like there are more of these types of uh, situations where. A black person, I've seen workplace uh, type incidents and just random, but where a black person is not doing anything or a black person is doing their job and a white person gets upset, a white person for whatever reason without provocation gets upset and it even becomes violent. If it's if it's not just yelling and some other tackiness, but looking like it, it could become violent. That's definitely something you should be thinking out, thinking about. And I say, especially if you if you know in your line of work, if you work uh, around white people that are intoxicated. If you work something that's late night, anything that seems like it's clubby or what have you, or a situation where it's just not the typical nine to five office where people at least pretend to have some sort of decorum about how they behave. Uh, I would really be mindful of that and thinking about how you're going to respond. What are you going to do? Is your response going to, you're calling the police or do you, are you supposed to get a manager or whatever it is you're supposed to do? Be thinking about your response. Cause it seems like more of these sort of things could happen. Uh, even if it's some, another black person in the area uh, being threatened, you know, as was, was the case here and threatening a child. I mean, Wow. You can, I mean, 30 seconds to finish up your purchase and no, I got to turn around and curse out this black child and his mom right here. Like, wow, that is that is the system of racism, white supremacy and dedication. And again, this is not ignorance at all. But uh, yeah, keep definitely keep that in mind and, and, and just thinking. Uh, certainly, if we have parents out there, be thinking. But also, if you if you work in that sort of environment, be thinking and even ask what's our policy if someone should get hostile like this to make sure everybody is you know clear about what's supposed to happen and if multiple people are supposed to do things uh, because you know it's just seeming like more of these sorts of incidents are taking place uh, did folks have any suggestions on that any thoughts on you know how you would deal with that particularly workplace uh, the way you would handle this you know if you're not on work might be a little different but if this sort of thing happens on your job uh, how you you know are thinking you would proceed Goss. Yes, ma'am. Stacy in London. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've was, I was got a couple of questions. Where was security? But on both incidents, because um, it just sounds like those situations went on for way too long. Um, particularly if you've got somebody who, a male, who's being quite physical. It just sounds like 
customers in general are being left vulnerable. And just to your point um, about these incidents increasing, obviously I'm in the UK, um, but it does seem like, especially just not so much in um, uh, printed media, but certainly on social media, it just seems like things are increasing over there. There's all those kinds of incidents. And I was just wondering if people are noticing a difference between um, uh, President Obama's presidency and Donald Trump's presidency, whether these kinds of incidents in the workplace are increasing. I'll meet my line. I think he said in the in the second, I guess the incident that happened more recently, like this week, though, was on Snapchat. I think he said that the the guy, the race soldier, left. They called the police, and the guy left before the police arrived. I don't, I don't remember about the first one. If security was called, or police, you know, were uh, were called, and that was a year ago. Do you, are, if, uh, Curtis, if you're still with us, do you remember uh, with the first situation where the police called or security or anything? So, uh, actually, with the first situation, the lady, she called the, the little boy, you know, the N-word in the stroller, and she kept shopping like nothing happened. I mean, she went up, she went up, on, you know, she kept shopping. Nobody did anything. And, you know, nothing happened to her. It's just the comfort level that she felt by doing it. I mean, nothing happened. She shopped and left. Sorry, you know what complained? Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, because I think there is a difference between calling the police, who would have to take, a, you know, at least a couple of minutes to arrive at the store, and actually having security present and a policy for how people are being treated. And, you know, it, if, if nothing else, it does leave staff vulnerable because they would end up having to, in some way, intervene in some dangerous situations. So maybe that's something to talk about. Sorry, I'll mute my line. Mm -hmm. I like that, too. That's a good point, too, uh, bringing it up from that. if, Like, if you're asking a question in terms of what, what to do, and particularly if it's happened twice at your store, I would definitely want to make sure we have a codified policy on this because it seems like this is not just a one-time, uh, once-in-a-lifetime type thing. Um because, you know, hey, we might have to get involved and you know, that could result in a workplace injury or anything, a lawsuit. So, yeah, like, let's make sure everybody understands, you know, what's supposed to happen if it looks like a situation could, out of, could get out of control with a uh, with customer. Um, yeah, I think uh, Stacey had asked the question if, if folks are seeming if there's any sort of increase in these sort of incidents of uh, racial violence and terrorism on the job since uh Trump's been in office if folks wanted a response to that and or if people had thoughts about you know if something like that were to happen in your workplace what would you do uh is this you know one of those you just call the police uh and let them deal with it you know how would you how would you go about dealing with this sort of situation uh at least something to be thinking about for people who work in you know situations where this sort of thing could happen uh folks have uh commentary they want to share number again 641-715 three six four zero and the code can I hear? Uh, uh yes sir we can hear you oh i didn't mean to cut you off uh Gus, this is uh, the voice again um with the situation with the child i think that she she kind of was in a predicament um on what to do because you know her child is the one that threw the shoe first so by hitting the lady um i'm just going by what you know my thought process would be I would be hesitant to call the police as well for using the N-word as far as um, my child assaulted this white lady. And you know when it comes down to any type of court action, they're always going to sympathize with the white person. And it might be some, if I take it there, she might come back and want to sue me. And I'm the parent responsible for the child. They're going to tell me, hey, it's your responsibility even though your child has a, a issue, it's still your responsibility. You're supposed to monitor your child. So I think that's probably why she probably broke down in crime. That is just my assumption. Um, with the with the policy, I think it's very important that you did say that. You emphasize on that, Gus, about the policy on what should happen because I've seen people before, and especially when I, I was a um, 
supervisor in a security company, and if you don't, if you don't ask what's the policy, what's the procedures, and something goes down on your shift, and you don't act on the chain of command or try to handle it the right way according to policy, you can get fired for that. So, and a lot of times, that's what whites will do. They'll find any loophole to fire you, and you'll be responsible for it. So you better protect yourself, knowing the policy. Have somebody there. Even bring somebody. If you're close with somebody at the job, have them come in and say, hey, man, let's, let's go up there and find out what's the policy. Then that way you have a witness, too. So if they ever said, no, I didn't tell you to do that, and then you'd be like, oh, no, they was with me, too. So always protect yourself in that situation. And um, I have an update later, if you want, um, about the, my ex. Remember I told you about my ex going to go get the raise and about what I told her to be codified and do? I have an update later. So I just wait till everybody else chime in on that, and I'll meet my line. Absolutely. Always want to hear commentary on getting a raise. Need as many nickels as as, uh, as we can get. Good point as well about you can be fired, too. For those And I've, I've worked those type of jobs where... There could be a security threat or something could happen. You know, someone gets upset and, you know, you might have to to respond, you know, to someone getting violently upset. Uh, And absolutely, they have procedures in some places. If you don't do exactly this is what could have they tell you up front. Yes, someone could get upset. Someone could get violently upset. And this is what you're supposed to do if that happens. And exactly. If you don't do that, you could get fired. So make sure. Absolutely. If you work in some sort of environment like that and it seems retail, I've seen people wig out at the Apple store all the time, almost been one myself um you should know the policy uh make sure that you check on it and particularly be mindful if it's a white person uh given that it seems like whites are are wigging out more and more and particularly on black people it looks like you know a white man and i would ask too what is the trigger point like you know do we have discretion right if it seems like this white person is being angry or threatening like at what point do we say hey this person has crossed the threshold and you know let's go ahead and you know move up our our response in terms of how we're going to deal with this if it's police or whatever whatever needs to happen um i guess my ad would be if i had any discretion in the situation i would have a lot less leeway uh with whites i would have no problem if a white person got booted out or police called on them and they were going to calm down they were just a little upset just having a tough day whatever uh it's one less race soldier to be hanging around uh abusing us uh the other folks have uh commentary they were going to add on this situation how you would how you would deal with this if this type of thing popped up in your work environment Can I be heard? <clears throat> yes, sir. Based on based on what I think I heard, um, I'll just try to put myself in that uh, position. Um, I, I don't I don't think the uh, caller uh, did anything incorrect, um, but in the period of time. Uh, Let's say the person uh, was an imminent threat to the uh, black female customer and child. Uh, I probably would have risked life and job to intervene in between somebody of, of uh, law enforcement or security if they haven't, you know, arrived. Uh, I, I mean, it's not like I was there, but sometimes things like that can happen almost in an immediate form, uh, I probably would have made a decision to uh, to uh, risk, uh, like I said, life as well as uh, job to intervene physically uh, if he was, you know, if the child was in imminent danger of getting hit by a uh, this uh, racist white person. Uh, of course, it was the other way around. If if the lady and the child was white, I would have just sat there and watched it <laughs> for the most part. Uh, probably would have turned on my phone and uh, and and said and said something, but uh, nothing other than that. But uh, I couldn't see myself uh, uh, if if the person turned violent, uh, not re- reacting uh, in counter violence. Uh, against that uh, that white person, I, I I probably wouldn't be able to live myself if I didn't intervene. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, uh, he he didn't say that happened, but 
uh, I know something like that could happen. Uh, as far as that concern, you see, I mean, you see all these crazy YouTube uh, uh, interactions that white people have, uh, or just people in general even have, but uh, especially with a white person on a on a uh, black child and 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 the uh, the mother. Uh, but I didn't. I, everything that he said, I think he was uh, basically correct. But uh, kind of like in that type of atmosphere, it'd be good to kind of like expect something like that happen. You get a lot of people who are quote unquote customers that that uh, you know have problems uh, like that in that type of atmosphere. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Reminded that sort of uh, atmosphere. I think he said this was at like a department store, a shoe store. You're probably going to have about 8 billion cameras in that sort of environment. I would keep that in mind as well. Increasingly, that's probably going to be the pace. Uh, that's probably going to be the case wherever you work at, even McDonald's. <laughs> They're probably going to have 15,000 cameras uh, around. So you should keep that in mind uh, that anything that happens, like I think he said uh, that this ended up being posted on Snapchat and probably a whole other places too. Someone whipped out their phone and everything. So I would keep that in mind uh, that, you know, it could be recorded uh, and this could be adjudicated. All your actions, what you did, what you said uh, in these type of incidents, it's a lot to have in mind. That's why I think it's even good just to be thinking about that in advance, uh, in advance, the type of things, those sort of situations. What would you do? What would you say? Uh, because so many times these things happen and it's 30 seconds. It's quick. The adrenaline is rolling and everything. I just think it's good to kind of have that so at least give some thought. Uh, per, uh, I think Emmy, I uh, hadn't heard from. Uh, if you had commentary you wanted to share, you should be with us. Greetings. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, greetings, beautiful people. Um, I have a couple of quick things that I'd like to share. Um, little vignettes or stories. Uh, one I thought was interesting, which has, um, and I'm choosing this word, particularly seasoned me um, into what my um, like educational journey is going to be. Um, I haven't taken certain maths and sciences in a very long time. And so I put a lot of effort in really understanding fundamentals. And so I don't try to memorize stuff just so that I can understand something. And so there was a problem that about um, stoichiometry and molarity. And I, um, I got to the right answer. And so um, I asked the professor if the way that I derived the right answer, was it just a fluke? And this is me, that specific word choice. Like I actually said that, is it a fluke or was you know, is that I did it again, would it still be logical? And his immediate response, he's, um, I don't know, Indian Pakistani, I don't know. And um, he was, he just immediately said it was a fluke. And then there was a white boy to my right who was like, but it kind of makes sense. And he said it under his breath, like he wasn't saying it for anyone to be heard, but the way the room is designed, uh, um, you can hear anybody. So, so then the professor thinks about it and he's like, actually, it does make sense. Um, it's because when he explained it, he had added like five or six steps, which completely convoluted the entire thing. It made it so confusing and I didn't like it. And so, um, not that I didn't like it. It was confusing. It was, um, it was just confusing. It was white supremacy type of like learning instead of making something clear, it just makes it confusing and makes it seem insurmountable or like only very select chosen people are able to understand these highly, scientific mathematical calculations, which I reject um, 100%. So anyway, the white boy says it, and he thinks about it, and he tells me, you know what, yeah, that does make sense. And then now he's actually speaking to me as someone who is obviously privy and is not failing. Like he doesn't, the classroom is so large that he doesn't know everybody by name. So he doesn't know. And I'm not failing, not even close to it. I'm, and sometimes I ask simple questions, but... It's to understand complex problems. Like the simple question can lead you to a very a, a answer that is viable for a complex problem. Um, and so he did that. I noted it. Didn't take it personal. I expect it. Nothing new. Um, but I definitely had a conversation with myself and said, this is not going to be something that I allow to uh, give me high blood pressure or make me feel stupid. Because whenever I ask questions, everyone likes to laugh um, and little things like that. 
Um, but like, let me just say it again, that I'm not doing poorly in this class, um, especially for someone who hasn't taken this chemistry in like nine or 10 years. So moving on. Um, then today, because we have the class every day, so then today he makes a comment about exuding a mastery over stoichiometry, and he looks at me, and I noted it. And the reason that I'm saying it is because I'm not going to allow that either to affect my level of commitment, what I've chosen to do, how I'm showing up, my codification, or how I feel about myself. So I'm not going to allow the snickering and the laughing to do anything, but I'm not going to be so shallow that superficial flattery makes me feel better about myself. What I'm doing, who I am, where I'm going, what I understand is for me, me alone, and I really don't care what anybody else um, has to say, good or bad. And I wanted to share that just because sometimes when, when I think about workplace raising, when I think about work, I understand how I make my money, but I also understand like what I'm doing. And um, how I make my money and what I'm doing, I used to wish that I could bring them together. Like, I wish I could do that, but I didn't find that way. So they're separate. Um, and I don't, and I just wanted to say that. So um, I'm the female out here in the DMV area who does the concierge work at the overnight residential property. And I called the cops on white people last weekend. So, um, and here's why. I don't get paid a lot of money, but even if I did, uh, we have a roof terrace, which I think I've shared, but for anyone who might not know, um, you know, this area real posh, so everybody got a lot of money, so buildings will add a rooftop terrace, have a pool, jacuzzi, whatnot, and that way they can charge people, you know, $3,000 a month for uh, a coffin, pretty much. And But this room shuts down at midnight, and I've had issues with shutting this down. That's my primary thing. For liability reasons, they can't have people up there drinking or whatnot um, past midnight, between the hours of midnight and 6. So I have to clear everybody out. I always give a 30-minute warning. Nothing's new. I always do it sometimes. That's why I'm not actually, like, speaking <laughs> at certain times because I'm dealing with these drunk white people. So, um, but anyway, at any rate, so I go up there, there's a large group of people. I give the 30, mo 30 minute warning. I let everybody know, A, enjoy your time. Just letting y'all know y'all got about 30 minutes. This was shut down at midnight. I leave, go do my thing, come back. Now there's even more people, which is, that happens. You know what I mean? I'm not tripping. So I say, you know, I go to each cause they're like clustered and clicks. And like, I don't know which one of y'all got the message, which one didn't about the clubhouse shutting down. If you didn't get the message, I'm sorry, but the clubhouse is shut down at midnight. So that means that you all have to leave. Now, this is an all-white group. There are no black people. There's like a couple of Asians and whatnot. So what was so fascinating is that they literally all like, like it stopped for a second, and then they looked at each other, and they non-verbally but non-physically shrugged and went immediately back to what they were doing. Nobody got up and was like, oh, you know what, my bad. Let's go ahead and get these bottles. Everybody, let's wrap this up. Let's take it back down to my apartment. We can finish this down there. Nobody did that. So I typically have this thing where I'm like, okay, well, they think I'm kidding. So I'll go sit on the inside part, and they can see me and realize that, you know, they need to vacate the premises. Well, I'm going to put it to you like this. I think I've shared a little while ago. I am uh, tired. White supremacy is wearing on me. I am doing the best that I can um, with what I have. And so I'm not, there's certain things I just cannot do anymore, and I'm not doing it. So uh, I told you once, that's all I have to say. Y'all are adults, number two, y'all are drinking, number three, y'all are white. I'm not doing this. So I went downstairs, and there's cameras. So I'm looking at the camera, and I'm literally watching. And I said, you know what, I'm not going to be somebody who's, you know, because I've been there, and if I lived here, I'd want to drink on a rooftop, do whatever I want to do. So I said, I'm going to give them, like, 10, 15 minutes to clear out, you know. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe they didn't want to feel like somebody was standing over them. That's cool. You know, whatever. Like, I'm understanding despite them being white, whatnot. So nobody is moving. As a matter of fact, because the door is locked, they're actually letting more people in. I said, okay, call the cops quick. Well, I called law enforcement. Let me stay codified in how I'm speaking. I called law enforcement. Told them what it was. 10, 15 minutes, all white law enforcement officers arrived. Now, I do not like to deal with enforcement officers, which has kept me from calling them in the past. I have felt that I would just deal with that on my own because I didn't want to have to deal with these 
uh, law enforcement officers. But like I said, I just had enough. And it, and it was getting, it was big. And see, nobody has called me a nigger yet. Nobody has called me a B to my face, but that's coming. And a short step after that, it's going to be a white female who is too drunk to keep herself together, either throwing some alcohol on me or trying to lay hands. And that's going to be a whole, whole nother workplace racism conversation that I'm going to have with y'all. But what I'm trying to do is keep this uh, very far away from me. So be removed from it. Anyway, they show up. I tell them, you know, I'm like, look, I done done all that I could do. It's supposed to be shut down. They said, oh, well, we've heard, you know, about this place before. I was like, okay, great. I'm going to take you right up there. Took them, let them in. They saw the cops were coming. People tried to scramble. Um, but they, you know, I didn't even stay to have the conversation with them. And, you know, they walked past the desk and it was like, well, you have a good night. And I was like, mm, and that was that. Um, so, yeah, I called the, uh, the law enforcement officers on the white people. And when I'm there next weekend, let them try me. At midnight, if I say get out, if you're still in there at 1210, I'm calling the law enforcement. And I'm going to call them each and every time um, because I'm not a security officer. I don't get paid enough. And I do not deal with white people who are intoxicated. I will help you get into your apartment. I will, you know, make sure the building doesn't burn down the best way I can, things like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, do my job. But in terms of actually dealing with them, I'm not doing that. And so that's just uh, what that is. There was something else I thought I wanted to um, share with you all, but it's escaping me at the moment. So, um, but thank you all for listening. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess with the classroom situation, because you shared that first, and it seems like a few times where you've uh, shared about asking questions in class where different white instructors have uh, slow blinked you or given some nonverbal cues uh, about, you know, this nigra asking questions here. Like, man, uh, continue to ask questions. Um, the best, the only... The only way thus far that I've been able to conceptualize it is uh, for anyone who watches uh, sports. <clears throat> the system of white supremacy, racist man, racist woman, racist child, they are the home team. The crowd is cheering for them and has signs up and, you know, we love you, Jane Elliott, and all that. They cheer and throw them roses and everything. For black people, you're the away team. It's going to be booing, hissing. They're throwing things at you. They're calling you names, calling your mother names, your grandmother names. Like that is the system of white supremacy. That's what it is. When you're in the classroom setting and you raise your hand to ask a question, which is what I thought is supposed to happen in a classroom. What better place to ask a question if you don't know the answer? And oh, they're snickering and laughing. And sometimes it'll be the teacher snickering and laughing. Oh, my God, you don't know that or trying to suggest that you're stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, once you answer this question, then I'll know it and we can move forward. And you all can laugh at the next thing when I'm ready to ask my next question. I mean, and just to move forward with that way of thinking, uh, I think that back to being a professional soldier, I wouldn't care if they laughed every time and in chorus uh, that I asked a question uh, and can expect it. Fine. I'm going to make sure that I come in tomorrow and I'm going to have 50 more questions so you can be ready to tune up again. Uh, that's just the mindset of just not being concerned about that at all uh, with the work situation. Uh, outstanding. Uh, I think that's the best way to ride it. Particularly, uh, again, those situations, this is a late night uh, setting where you're by yourself. Uh, alcohol and white people, I said that all the time, one of the worst combinations in the universe. White people and alcohol. And I've said specifically, if you are on one of those jobs and you know, okay, it's white people I'm going to have to deal with, white people under the influence late at night. You might have to have a totally different code about how you operate because that is a uh, special danger, right? A peculiar hazard uh, that you, you know, have to, to address accordingly. And that, that is dynamite, uh, in my opinion. 1210, every time I'm calling the enforcement officials, I got it on speed dial. Like, <laughs> that's what it is. Uh, and being consistent, and particularly with your workplace, since you shared before, where you've got tenants making death threats and saying that they're going to kill this person if they use this exit again or whatever it is, like, oh, no, I have zero tolerance or anything. Uh, I'm late at night. I'm a female. I'm by myself. People are under the influence and intoxicated and fighting and doing God knows what. Uh, 
the the room shuts down at 12. You have your 30 minute warning. 12:10, the police will be called. That's what it's going to be every time, especially if it's all white people. Oh yeah, 12:09, 12. I might even be trying to slide it up, but yeah, the enforcement officials will be called, and that's that. I think that's uh, outstanding, uh, and that's the way that I would explain it to you know anybody uh, on the job. So, oh my gosh, do you have to? You've called the police ten times uh, this month on them. Do you have to be so? Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it might be 15 times uh, by the time we get to July. I mean, that's exactly that's a plus uh, codification with the ruffians that you have to deal with uh, in that building. Uh, Other folks have uh, comment or responses to what they've uh, heard from listeners or if you have your own situation you would like to discuss. Uh, Other folks have commentary. That's just me again. Can I say like three really quick things? I reckon. I'll be really quick. Uh, I think Ms. Stacy asked if there was um, notice any kind of increase since Trump has been elected. If I'm correct, I might be mistaken. If so, please forgive me, but I think I heard that. I have. Um, I'm out here. Like I said, I'm in the DMV area, but I live in Virginia, um, and I definitely feel it with the white people. Um, but specifically at the job, that clubhouse, I told you that there's a big chalkboard that, um, you know, you can write, you know, like, happy anniversary, happy birthday, whatever you want to write. Kids can write on it, whatnot. Um, I'll go in there, and people have written Trump on there. And uh, I think I even took a picture just for record because uh, it wasn't like they were having, like, a Trump rally or anything, but I felt that that was for me because they know, like, everyone knows, because I don't really take off like that. I don't have it like that to be taken off. So I'm generally always at work on the weekends, and they people who frequent the clubhouse know that, I'm there at 1130, um, and I'm there at midnight. And so it was right up there for me, and I looked at it and was like, oh, okay, and kept it moving. Um, and then I forgot to tell the uh, quick little story about um, a exam review that we were having for biology. Now, I don't talk. I have shared before. Um, that's just my codification. Now, plus, I'm just I'm tired. Um, but so nobody has ever actually had a conversation with me in the class. They've only heard me ask questions. So um, they don't really know anything about me or even that I'm personable or have a personality. We had to split the room in half and play a trivia game. Um, And it was funny because all the black people (laughs) came to my side. They were like, oh, that's where I want to be. And I thought that was really cool. Like I smiled really hard um, about that. It made me kind of happy. But so anyway, we had to come up with team names. So it was really, we had like three white girls, everybody else was black. And then all the white people was, the other white people were in the other group. And their name, now, although I don't talk, see, the thing is, okay, let me say this. This is for anybody, like maybe young people. This would be something I would say to young people. Um, Whether you intentionally shine or not shine, as people say, that's not going to keep white people's evil eye off of you. You can be as quiet as you want. That's not going to mean that white people aren't looking at you. You can be as loud as you want, and it doesn't mean that white people aren't looking at you. Um, if you're serious, white people might even look at you more and suspect that they want to attack because you are being what they don't want to see in black people, which is a, a intelligence and seriousness and all this other kind of stuff. So I actually looked at this, and I was like, man, this is interesting. We had to come up with team names. We chose ATP. It was biology. We chose ATP. The white group chose dominators now mind you all the black people are on this side all the white people are on that side and they chose the dominators so we're gay and we're missing like a couple and they're getting all rowdy or whatever the girls right and slow and um like they're really getting kind of aggressive i think this kind of ties into that trump thing too you know what i mean like there's a lot that's not broken but whether we want to accept it or not white people really do not see us as um equals or better or smart, intelligent, whatever. Some of us just might have gotten through the cracks. So they're really, you know, taking this thing on. Now, I'm not... <laughs> so I snatched the paper from the girl. I was like, I'm writing now. So when the questions get... get the actions even finished, I know the answer. We're turning in the paper, getting all of it. Skip, 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 skip. We end up dominating them. Point blank period. They was like, how she's even answering it so fast? Never talk nothing, but I know the answer. Because I wasn't going to have us just look like that. I wasn't, uh-uh. Screw that. I didn't care about the game to begin with, but when they put it the way that they did, 
and started getting all kind of redneck with it, like redneck-ish with it. I was like, no, nah, screw that. So we won. And two white people from the other group actually left class. They actually packed their stuff and left before the game was even finished. So whatever, it is what it is. I probably wasn't as codified as I should have been. But I even said it. I was like, they getting all snappy and whatnot. Like, no, nah, we about to go ahead and, uh, and win. And we did. Um, yeah, there was a third one, but that one's not even as important right now. So maybe next week. Thank you all again for um, listening to me. Clowning in the classroom. Wow. That, uh, I don't remember who it was, but someone had said they were, uh, they were walking. It was just an entrance, just a door. <laughs> Nothing special. You didn't get a pot of gold. There was not $200. Just a door. They were walking through this door. And I guess a white person was almost parallel with them. And it was like the white person was speeding up as if they were in a race to see which of them was going to get through the door first. And it's just like, what What sort of meant to everything? Exactly that. Any and every time that white people, uh, white people are in contact with non-white people, that's what they're thinking. Dominate. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that we dominate and we are on top. Uh, what I think fail as a co- colonial mentality. The mentality of the system of white supremacy is always present. That's what they are about. Their entire uh, existence and purpose for existence. White culture. That is the totality of it. It's about dominating black people. So, yeah, of course, that's what it would be. And bravo. Uh, I mean, I guess they made it so flagrant you couldn't uh, you couldn't avoid it. Naming their team dominators being the exclusive white team. But outstanding job of black self-respect to foil them. And, and uh, I am I am not surprised. I have seen that before when uh, race soldiers lose out to the niggers. Uh, they <laughs> turn and don't even have the dignity to stay around for the rest of class or what have you, anything else like, ugh, lost to the Negroes, I'm done for the team, going to get a coffee, delectable Negro. Uh, uh, the caller, 4243, caller at 4243, did you have commentary? Hello, can I be heard? Hi, Red. Hello, um, Hello, thank you for taking my call. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to first say I kind of um, called in late, so I apologize. I won't be able to make comments on uh, what everyone said prior to MA, but um, I definitely wanted to say that, um, MA, I definitely understand how you feel as far as being tired. I actually, um, this week, because it's, it's basically an update on what isn't happening with me and my job and asking questions. And um, I had just been really having anxiety attacks because from basically from last week or a couple weeks ago, it might have been, I had asked my uh, supervisor, my new supervisor, a question. And I, and I definitely appreciate for what I've been learning um, since listening to the cows and other avenues as far as definitely being suspected. Uh, definitely suspecting white people of being racist and definitely the more refined ones. Um, As I spoke about my supervisor, and I feel like he's definitely refined. So, like with me, I've always tried to follow all the policies, the procedures as far as how to do the job, and then also when it came to, like, um, HR stuff, like absences, things of that nature, just at least knowing even if I were to be late or something like that. So... When it came to knowing how to do my job, I'm one of the the few people on the team who have been there, been doing um, what I'm doing the the longest. There's only, like, a couple of the people who have been doing it um, longer than me, and literally a couple. Um, And the supervisor, like I said, he's pretty new. So I first review the procedures. If there's – and the messed up thing about it is that I've actually had to go to these suspected racists and tell them, based on what she told us in a previous meeting, it's not it's not actually lining up with what is in these procedures. You need to get these updated. And I would have to walk them through as far as what needs to be updated so that way this is helping out everyone in the area. So everyone can do their job uh, correctly. And so 
fast forward back to, you know, a couple weeks ago, I spoke with my supervisor, I emailed my supervisor just like we've all been speaking about um, emailing, and he will then ask me questions, and he was basically saying, well, you know what, this is your job. You're, you're assigned to do this, so you need to figure it out. And that really upset me because, if the procedures are incomplete or if I'm telling you all that, hey, this is some stuff that's not in there and you're and based on what I'm saying, you're updating it, um, it, it, it would kind of, and then also, like, and I'm very glad that I've, I've stayed, I have stayed humble whenever he would want to give me some type of accolades in a meeting or, or said, something to, uh, said something to me about what he's told um, upper management or something like that about me. I've always said, you know, I have just referred back to the procedures. So I kind of felt like this would give him a strong indication of I know what limitations I have. I know what you told us, what, what we're told that we can do. So first time he says, hey, this is your work. You need to basically figure it out. I got upset, and I just left it alone. I asked someone else who, who has been doing the same thing as I do. Um, and I was able, and it was having to be a white person, uh, another white person. So I just took that advice. So I come into, I come across another situation where, again, I review the procedures, and the messed up thing about it is that um, I review the procedures, and, it, and the procedures take you so far, and then it'll say, well, you need to speak with your supervisor about it to kind of figure it out. So I go to him. Now, this is, but this is prior. For the, uh, I, I asked him the question before I reviewed the procedures again because I, I, I feel like I have a pretty good memory about what it says, especially if I'm telling the people this is what you're missing in these rules. So, again, he says, this is your work. You're, you, you are supposed to do it. Um, not only myself, but upper management, management is, are challenging you all, and it made it seem as if everyone on the team, everyone in the area is being challenged to just come up with these solutions on their own. And um, so, and I felt like basically with him just re just doubling down on this is your work, we're telling you that, hey, we're challenging you, we, you, you should figure it out, and then him asking me questions as if that's supposed to help me to come to the conclusion. And then um, he also put within the email, you know, if you want to talk to me so we can kind of, um, I forgot what he said, but you can, you can always give me a call so we can kind of just, you know, talk through it. And it just really, I just really let it get to me. And I kept trying to calm down, but I didn't, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I just finally, you know, I, I, I'm feeling like I'm tired because, um, like I said, I, then after that, after I, you know, tried to, after I calmed down, and it took basically a day because I'm, because I'm feeling like this suspected race, racist is telling me you're not doing, how I'm taking it that you're not doing your work. This is something we're paying you to do this, despite the fact that we don't actually give you all the information to do what you're supposed to do. So when I go back and check the procedures, when it says, review it with your supervisor, I, I just kind of felt like it, I'm, I'm running, literally running up against the wall. So um, at this point, and I spoke with my family members, and they're like, you know what, if you have to um, make some mistakes or what have you, if you have, and if it's financial, if they're telling you, if they're, if they're, they're quote, unquote, telling you, they're challenging you, if they're um, telling you that's what you need to do, then you just need to do it because it's not your, it's, you know, it's, it's not your assets that you're losing. So um, I've, I've kind of gotten, I've kind of calmed down from that. Um, and another thing that actually kind of like upset me because in the email, like I said, he made it seem as if he's telling everybody on the team, hey, we're challenging you to come up with these answers on your own. So I asked a, 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 a non-white person on the team, I'm like, have you been able to ask our supervisor questions? Um, and she and you know the person they're like yeah they the supervisor seems like 
definitely willing to help and um, didn't seem like they were having any issues. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite sure where this is coming from. So I didn't know if it was maybe just maybe he is showing favoritism to certain people. I was actually uh, um, around one point where he was going into so many, so much detail about um, um, this, this one white person on the team was so frustrated about something so, so small. And he, he was just spending like 30, 30 minutes plus just trying to help calm the person down and give the person, um, you know, just this encouragement. And it just really sickened me. And I'm still kind of upset about it. But um, I, I, I guess that's all I have to share this week. Thank you for listening. That's terrible. I'm uh, sorry to hear you've had to, to deal with that where it's, you know, impacting your health. You said you started that, I think, with saying that you, you know, had a panic attack, at least one. Uh, as a result of the strain of all this. That's why I say this is serious. I mean, <laughs> tons of black people uh, deal with this sort of terrorism on their job on a regular basis. And it has serious, like sometimes like life threatening uh, health ramifications. Uh, that's why I think, you know, this is, is so important and it's something that we should, you know, seriously be talking about. And I'm just trying to make sure I understood it correctly with the, the policy and procedure, which is something that we talk about all the time. And even to me, this sounds like what if I heard you correctly, where you, you, you were saying you get to a certain point in the manual and it's uh, speak with your supervisor and you all are working for it. To me, with that type of vague language where it's not specific, it's not exact about do this, this, and this, uh, where it just it leaves room for confusion. Uh, it leaves room for discretion, where you can just kind of pick and choose, and it seems like that's even what's being suggested. Like you all just kind of go through and figure it out on your own. <laughs> where, I mean, what is going on? Just set up for failure and problems uh, for the non white person. But am I understanding it that? Uh, I guess that there are some white people that are reporting to you or you're supposed to be letting them know whether or not they're in compliance with policy and procedure and they just are refusing to adhere to policy and procedure even when you go back and point out, you know, this is, is not in accordance, this is not right, and they just continue to not adhere to what you're saying. Is that part of the problem? Well, well no, um, I don't have anybody reporting to me. It's just that basically to help out everyone in the area, and of course, I, I mean, I, it, it, there are non, non-white people in the area, so I try to make sure to go through basically the manual and point out things that are outdated, point out things that um, they've told us that, you know, have changed and very recent. So so that, that's basically what I was um, getting at. And so it just, I think the main thing was that I was, I just really got really upset with the fact that it made it seem, his words made it seem as if I wasn't doing my job. And really from the record, I'm, I haven't been making mistakes as far as if other people have reviewed my work to, for accuracy, they could not find mistakes, the, you know, the pieces that they have reviewed. So I felt like that was, that was like mainly like the slap in the face and the fact that I'm not hearing from other people, if I'm hearing other people being able to ask him questions and I can't, I'm the one who's supposed to be challenged, that I just felt like that was, was unacceptable. And, you know, just with him covering his track saying, saying that not only am, do I think that you should, you know, try to figure this out on your own, but also other upper management people feel like, you know, some basically just cutting off my my way of going above him, they also feel that you should be trying to challenge yourself when I've been doing that even before he's gotten over to this area. So 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 that's basically it. I see, I got just got confused I think the first time uh around. I see. And what I guess was it just the insinuation that you weren't doing your work? Is that what made you so frustrated about it? It was that, and then 
on just I, 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 it, it is my fault that I feel like I, I, I like to have things in, if, especially since this is assets that I'm dealing with, if, or if, if they don't have enough information, I don't like to just basically give away money that I don't have. And, and I like to have the answers. But with, with them, it's kind of like, like, like you said, you know, it is vague at times. It is kind of like, you know, just go with your best judgment. And, and that, that, that varies from person to person. And there have been other meetings where they, they have been trying to have more um, congruency between the team because I might do something one way, another person might do it another way. And if we technically, it, it, it's just so um, different between people. Hmm. I see. I see. It sounds like, if I'm understanding it, it sounds like, you know, you try to, to be an efficient employee, particularly something dealing with finances and numbers, trying to be efficient and as accurate as possible. Uh, it's seeming like they're more, you know, hey, we are we allow for, you know, quite a bit of imprecision. It seems like a lot more imprecision than what you would tolerate. It seems like that's a part of this as well. Is that is it, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that, that's what it seems like, but then it's like also they like to change things like consistently. So it will be at one time, and I've, I've been with this particular company for a, a few years, and one thing might be one way, you know, in year one or two, and then once we get to the beginning of year three, then it's like, oh, well, we decided to change that because now we see that there are too many losses. So I feel like one of my problems is that, that and, and I'm not, I don't, I don't consider, like, like, like I've been saying before, in different um, workplace racism segments or whatever, that I, I look at it as this is their stuff. So I'm trying to be, um, I guess, precautious as far as not wanting to give away too much, then it'll fall back on me. Um, so... That's kind of what it is, but it, it's so basically, yeah, they'll say, well, we kind of, um, we have mechanism, mechanisms in place to, to where we can kind of allow for some losses, but, but like I said, it, it, I don't know, I can't really tell how much is too much, basically, and, if I, and I'm feeling like, you know, I, if I don't have that okay to go ahead and say, you know, if this is fine, you can go ahead and do it this way. That's what kind of, that uncertainty is definitely what it is, is the most anxious about it. Mm, got it. And that, that sort of thing to me, doing any sort of job with white people, with racists, and you, particularly something working with numbers, money, finances, I'm, the, I'm supposed to be the person that's in charge uh, of managing or at least one of the people that is principally responsible for managing and keeping account of this. Uh, and, you know, we're we're tolerating uh, this type, this level of imprecision uh, and, and vagueness that would I can totally understand how that would present panic attacks, because I could totally see this being the sort of thing where uh, they wait a year down the road and say, oh, my gosh, we lost all this money and it's your fault. And like it'll you know, it'll be the exact type of thing that you've been pointing out all along like that. That would bother me uh, a lot. I would do I would do as much as you can to protect yourself uh, while, you know, getting your work done where it's not uh, causing you a problem. But I mean, that would in with that just because things are so imprecise. And when you say where they keep changing things up, that, too, uh, where you can't you can't even get into a consistent uh, method of doing things uh, where we're precise, we're accurate and, and we're not changing the policy or how we go about doing business from week to week or month to month or whatever it is like that. I can totally under and that, that might even be a part of it to just have this total, you know, chaos on the job uh, where, you know, it's causing you all of this mental anguish, but I would do as much as you can to protect yourself uh, in that situation as possible. Cause man, it, it sounds like something rife uh, or a situation where things can go wrong and, then they can end up pointing the finger at you. Uh, did did uh, folks have any any thoughts or suggestions on what we heard from Red in the situation? Uh, 
that's a tough one when they're changing the rules up uh, every other week or so and then allowing for a lot of <clears throat> not being, you know, exact with numbers. A lot of the word. Typically, it's been my experience, whites, when it gets to numbers, I mean, it's real precise. Uh, we do not, you know, when it starts to be a lot of sloppiness, that's when you can be on the lookout for an Enron uh, type situation. Uh, I know, uh, I think, was it The Voice? I'm trying to make sure I recall correctly. Was it The Voice? Did you say you had your own workplace situation that you wanted to discuss, uh, even though you had spoken already, or was that a different caller? No, that, that was me. I was saying I had to update um, okay. for you yes, about sir. the um, the raise. Yeah, um, you remember last, I think last time I was telling you guys about the experience that my people were going through at the workhouse, at the job, where um, a Hispanic, well, I always say Hispanic because I want people to understand that Hispanic is really white, but I just don't want you to look at a Hispanic and say that they're Hispanic, but they're white. A Hispanic white female um, got into it one at an office party. Like you always say about be real careful about those office parties. So um, our people and the co her coworkers, they always go to the office party because in the incentive of going to the office party, they like to throw in gifts. They give away um, over the, uh, to Paris. Um, they give gifts to Jamaica. Also, they give stereo TVs and $500 worth of cash. So these are the gifts that they normally give away during the office party. Now, this particular lady that I told you guys about last week, um, it all stemmed from the office party that just passed that they had, and she got intoxicated because, you know, at office parties, they always buy the bar, so they tell you to drink up, drink up. So she got intoxicated, and she bumped into... The supervisor, the director, the supervisor director that's at, at their location, he is the um, white homosexual male that I've told you before that hired his own lover and put him on staff, had him doing a low, it was like a low maintenance job, but getting more money than the rest of the staff. Um, so she had bumped into the director had some words for him and it wasn't pleasant words she was going off on him and just embarrassing him but she was and um, um, the next day I guess whenever they went back to uh, the work place he had called it in the office and they hashed things out in the midst of hashing things out that's when I told you guys about last time about how he ended up giving her $20 an hour. Mind you, she hasn't been working at that company long. So instead of this lady being fired for her irrational ways, the two whites get on code and he compensates her $20 an hour. Now, the regular staff are making anywhere from $10 to $15 an hour. So, and they've been there longer than her. So last week, um, when she when she had got into a, um, when she, she got the, her way, she comes back out and flaunts, she flaunts it out to um, a couple of the coworkers who happen to be black. Like, yeah, you know, I was about to leave, and um, instead they gave me $20 an hour to stay. Ha <laughs> ha, you know, kind of boasting and bragging about it. So that's when I told you that my people, they are, were very highly upset because they've been working there for a while. They haven't been getting raises. You know, the company always always hush hush them up about the raises. So she, I, that's when I gave her the advice to go in there because they wanted to go as a group. And I told her, if you go in the group, sometimes you get the, you know, low end of the stick. So I said, go in there. Now that you have that uh, power, I think they're now. Oh yeah, I remember. I told her to wait till it got on, till it officially got on record, before she went in there, and that's that's what she did. So when it officially got on record, she went in there, and she told him exactly what happened. He was irated. He was irated that the lady, the, the uh, white lady that he gave the raise to, would go out there and tell anybody because by law. You're not supposed to discuss 
your payroll with any other employee. You can get fired for that. And so he ended up calling her into the office, the white lady back into the office after my people went in there to discuss that, you know, it's not right. So when he called her back into the office, he, she was saying that it was in there for like an hour, hour and a half. And then, you know, she exited out of the um, of office. So the following day, um, when they officially announced, um, you know, they officially gave everybody their, their raises. Oh, it's, they only officially gave uh, my people people's and her team the raises. He didn't tell them what they were getting but they end up getting um, nowhere near what she got. They didn't get nowhere near what the lady got at $20 an hour. So, you know, she was very mad about that. Like, you know, that's not fair. But what happened was the same team, remember Gus, I was telling you that I was telling her not to go as a group. And the same team that she was around that said, hey, they wanted to, you know, actually go in there and talk. And all of a sudden, now everybody is, oh, they thanking the director. Oh, thank you for the, so appreciate it. Now my people and her friend, her good friend, looks like the enemy at the job. So everybody now is looking at them like, like they're the bad person. They're the ones who's always speaking out and so the director got mad, and then he started coming. He, he, he brought both of them in the office and said, everybody's excited with you two. Uh, like, what is the issue with you guys? You guys seem like the bad ones out of everybody. And it was, it was like, what are you talking about? We were just saying that it wasn't fair. And it was like, oh, well, everybody else is thanking me. And then she said, he burst out in some fake tears and started crying and weeping and she said she just left out of there and she just, just let me know, like, you know, that it's just, it's just unfair. And I told her, I said, you know what, um, I'm kind of proud of you because what you did is you actually leveraged all the raises for everybody instead of you guys going as a group. They could have turned you down and hush hush you guys on that level. But by you going in there on a one on one level, he's looking at it like, okay, if this white lady I gave $20 an hour for, turned around and told everybody, if I give you that amount of money, then you might turn around and then I'm going to have the same issue, the same domino effect. So you know what? Let me just give everybody this raise in your group, the same thing, and everybody could be happy. And that's exactly what happened. So I told her, you know, you might be the bad person now. In the long run, you help them out. And I told her that I fought a lot of times at my job, my ex-job, and you've seen where that got me. So, you know, you, you are the bad person up front, but in the long haul, you end up doing more good for the people around you than you think they are or, or the ones that appreciate you for what you learn. So I just wanted to give you guys that update, and I just told her to document everything because, see, now everything is on record. Right now, she has the upper hand. Because anyhow, this company does my people's wrong. She can all have a great case. So I told her, just keep documenting, because the more and more you pile up, she has so much stuff, and pile up. And the more and more you're vocal, and they're going to look at you in the background, but they can never say that you didn't. And that's the key. Once you don't say anything, and they have every reason to dismiss any claim that you have have came forward. But when you come around, then your case is very, very great and credible. And that's all I wanted to uh, um, say to you guys. And I'm your mom. Wow. Context of white supremacy Thursdays, workplace racism. Uh, the the word fair. I uh, heard that a number of times. I do encourage and have encouraged listeners uh, for a number of years uh, to not use the word fair uh, when we are using a word that is used to suggest uh, correctness, correctness uh, or justice or uh, equity, 
impay, uh, and the same term is also used uh, as a synonym for white. Uh, it, <clears throat> it strongly suggests, conveys that uh, the individuals classified as white are the only ones who are deserving of equal, just, equitable uh, compensation, pay. Uh, that's what it uh, strongly suggests. Uh, if you're not white, then you don't deserve correct pay. Uh, so watch the word fair. Uh, but that is uh, <clears throat> racist. I mean, that's that is what you can do when you operate from a position of power. Uh, you can come in and dump, you know, a few nickels uh, in the slave quarters and have them fighting each other. Mr. Fuller's talked about that a lot in the word fair, why you shouldn't use it, why we shouldn't use it. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's very easy for racists to do that sort of thing and, and to immediately in the span of two seconds uh, from everyone hating and talking bad about the no good racist overseer to, oh, master's the greatest. Uh, we got, you know, fresh watermelon uh, on the plantation. It's easy for them to do. And then everybody will be mad at you. Uh, and I think I've heard Mr. Fuller talk about that. It's in almost the exact same thing where he was trying to get compensation, not just for himself, but for all of the black people trying to get raises and better treatment for the black people there. And they ended up being mad at him. You're like, who is old troublemaker Neely? Who is this guy, man? Scott making it bad. He's, you know, doing things that are making their their jobs easier where they're getting better benefits and what have you. Uh, so just, you know, being mindful that 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 is the. That is a product of the system of white supremacy uh, in terms of it being very easy for uh, the black person who is trying to produce justice uh, for that to end up being the villain that even, you know, other black people don't like or appreciate what that person is trying to do to just expect that to be the case, not be stunned by it and to just continue, you know, going about uh, being a professional soldier, uh, as I said before. But that's. That happens a lot. Uh, it is amazing uh, how frequently that dynamic plays out uh, on the job where everyone hates uh, the ogre overseer and then doesn't take very much. Uh, a Fourth of July picnic, anything. And uh, all of a sudden he is he and or she is beloved. And uh, the black people that, you know, are steadfast, uh, they are now the outcasts. Uh, I think, uh, Stacy, in, in London, did you have... Uh, an additional uh, update that you were going to give us? Oh, I know it's late over there. Are you still with us, Stacy? We might have lost Stacy. I know it's, uh, if I can get my math correct, it is uh, 326 London time. So all would be forgiven if she uh, decided to call it 326 Friday a.m., London time. <clears throat> uh, but if other folks had commentary, they wanted to make sure uh, they get in before we get ready to wrap up workplace racism. Feel free. The number again, six, uh, six, four, one, seven, one, five, three, six, four, zero. The code five, six, four, nine, four, three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, Mr. Steele, uh, you had a hand up. Did you have commentary you wanted to share, Mr. Steele? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. What? Yes, sir. Awesome, awesome. A recording from uh, Pomona at this time, Pomona, California. And I just wanted to uh, remind uh, listeners of the cows uh, about um, th that you should do an ego search uh, at least once a month, even, uh, you know, if you're uh, in a job or uh, you're, you're not looking for work or anything like that, just once a month, uh, at least take the time to uh, search for your name on all of the major, uh, uh, all of the major search engines. That way you can keep track of, uh, of any sort of information uh, that may be publicly available about yourself uh, that you may not know, or um, you can easily find out if people are talking about you. Um, I was recently uh, uh, made aware of uh, some items uh, that were uh, on a search engine um, about uh, an incident uh, that I well, went through back uh, 
almost a decade ago. And, um, and this information was not accurate, and I had to contact the website that put it up there, and um, I had them take it down. Um, and then uh, the other issue that came up was that it was still coming up on cash searches. So a lot of these search engines, uh, they have um, forms that you can fill out to get any sort of information that may not be accurate, that may um, be libelous, uh, if you have any of that information about you out there or any of that information that shows up on a search engine, you have the right to uh, contact um, these different companies and request that information be taken down. Also, uh, I do recommend that um, you have your um, social media presence under aliases. If you can maintain aliases to uh, your social media presence, uh, that would be ideal. And then also, you also want to maintain an internet presence of your actual self with your actual name that you kind of have parked and that you can control. Because if you don't, uh, somebody else may, and they can easily engineer um, some very unsavory uh, presentations of you uh, if you don't. I was also made aware that somebody got my got a hold of my government name and was uh, using it uh, on social media, and I also had that taken down. So um, I definitely recommend that victims of racism uh, go ahead and uh, – please do what they call an ego search. You know, search your name, search any aliases that you may have used in the past, and make sure that your internet presence is, uh, is to your liking and is uh, accurate. Um, also, uh, just, I guess, um, in, in my workplace or my alternative workplace, um, I do comedy. And um, I recently just uh, made a new landmark in my career. I, I got booked for my first uh, uh, comedy club date um, ever. Uh, this is an actual comedy club. It's not like a bar or something like that. Um, I'll be at the Van Nuys uh, Comedy Club on Wednesday, July 12th at 9 p.m. So I'm, I'm really geeked about that. And, uh, and um, I'm, I'm very happy that I've made that uh, progression. But, yeah, just uh, um, for victims of racism, I just want to say um, keep your Internet presence clean. Uh, maintain uh, an Internet presence just so that you have something, you know, out there that is you. If somebody should, you know, do a really, really deep search and, and then find that out. And then um, uh, also... Uh, go ahead and contact any sort of third-party sites or any sort of uh, 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 search engines that may have um, unsavory information about you uh, pop up. And that includes, uh, you know, foreclosures. Uh, that includes, uh, you know, um, uh, evictions. That includes uh, uh, arrests. All sorts of records of, of you are available online and um, you need to um, be proactive in making sure that your internet presence is clean. Thank you so much. Great suggestions. Great suggestions. Uh, the person who dialed in last four digits, three, two, four, six, three, two, four, six. Did you have commentary? Yes. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, greetings to you, to the hosts, the callers, and the listeners. This is Mahandisi. I was going to speak about my uh, schooling when I was in college. Actually, I had uh, taken uh, some semesters off, and but I still uh, frequent the college um, at the time. And I had, I was, I was at the college. I heard one of the senior professors. Um, actually, the guy who put in the Pan African Studies Department at this university, I heard him speak, and I was impressed with some of his words. And I spoke to him afterwards, you know, just telling him that I um, I understood what he was saying, and I was impressed with his work, what he was saying. And he told me to come to his class, 
And so, uh, so I went to his class. I did the work, you know, with an the work and everything. I would read the books. And this is a Pan-African Studies class, so they're talking a lot about what we're calling white supremacy. And these people were calling white. And, uh, and I had uh, mentioned after reading uh, 2,000 Seasons, we read a number of books. Um, what I've said before, I, I, this one, I think it was one or two, I think there was Uh, let's see. Are you with us, sir? I wasn't hearing you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. I, I was not hearing you for a few seconds. Yeah, I'm not hearing you <clears throat> now. Like, mm. I can... Okay, now I can hear you. I don't, it's it seems inter uh, intermittent. Like uh, I can see the volume meter moving on the switchboard for me, and it seems intermittent at times for you. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you uh, if you want to maybe try it again. Just uh, kind of start. I heard the 2000 seasons part, and then uh, you said uh, two, it was one. I guess you uh, you all read that book in the class as a part of uh, this Pan African Studies class, and you said it was one part. After you mentioned two thousand seasons, if you want to start from there, maybe. Sure. Well, the just to go to to what I was wanting to say, the white female, the female who calls herself white, was making commentary, and I had said to the class, or I said to her, um, well, I said to the class that you know I didn't really understand uh, what her input, uh, her input, and I was saying, um, but she was saying, well, what can I do? You know, because I, um, because people were getting upset that she was even in the class. And she was saying, well, what can I do? And I said, well, you know, you can stop being white. And, and she, um, and then she was like, well, uh, well, she said a number of things, but she was like, well, um, well, what, what does that mean? Uh, uh, she said that, oh, I was telling her, no, you're not even the, I can look at you and tell that you're not even the first group that started calling yourself white. And then, she, and so you can stop. You can just stop being white. You can choose not to, not to classify yourself as white with being white. And she said, "Well, what does that that mean that I have to kill myself?" And I was like, "Well, no, that's not what I said. I had said that you could stop being white." And she said, "Well, you said earlier that you know, just that I remind you of the slave master." And I said. And I didn't say anything further than that. And then she went back to, well, her solution was to stop being white. She had to kill herself. I thought that was a really interesting conclusion. And what ended up happening was she went to the the head of the Pan-African Studies Department, who was another black man, and she told him what happened. There was actually two black women in that class, too, went and told what happened. And uh, the that that. That professor, the head of the Pan African Studies Department, approached me. I don't know if it was a month later or something at a, an event, and he, he was telling me that I was harassing and threatening uh, the female, the female that calls herself white, and that uh, and that he can kick me off of campus. Now, telling him, man, I'm not even taking classes. He said, no, nah, I can kick you off to campus and all this other sort of thing. This guy knew me, so I didn't really understand, you know, why he was going that route. And then, uh, so he ended up emailing the professor that had invited me to this class uh, about the situation. So the professor, um, well, and he told me not to go back to that class again. Well, I went ahead, went back to the class, and the professor told me he was, he he pulled me aside and said, um, you know, let me let me talk to you. Let me tell you what's going on. And he said he didn't understand why the um, head of the Pan African Studies Department why that man was saying that I was being threatening to the lady, to the female, because he didn't feel like I was being threatening, and he was there the whole time. He's the one who invited me to the class, and he was saying, you can stay in my class. And as a matter of fact, we're going to go back into the class, and you're, you're going to stay in. Just you know, just don't say anything right now. Um, 
and and then he uh, he talked to he talked to the head of the Pan African Studies Department, and basically I, I don't know exactly what he told him, but he he basically was saying that I'm okay to be in his class, and you know he overruled that decision because he's the one that started the Pan African Studies Department in the first place. He's the reason why this guy got hired, and then so the guy um, ended up telling my mother um, that this professor that that I the class that I was in this professor that he has the same effed up ideas that I do. And that's the thing that's wrong with him. And uh, he was just going on about how messed up the professor who had me in his class, how messed up his ideas were. And then basically saying I had the same effed up ideas. And so I think that's a, a good example of um, workplace racism. Uh, the other thing was, was um, in school, when I was in my uh, family school, they had a private school. And uh, they moved the school from Ohio to West Virginia. And in West Virginia, they put a bunch of Confederate flags in the in the schoolyard before before we uh, before we got to the school one one morning. They put a whole bunch of small little Confederate flags in the schoolyard. And uh, my aunt ended up having to take them all out and was telling us about you know what was going on. And uh, she would speak, and the rest of my family would speak pretty. Um, pretty clearly, as clear as they could, I guess, about racism, white supremacy, is what we call it. So, uh, thank you. Wow. Fascinating classroom experience. Uh, always interesting uh, having one or two suspected racists present for those type of discussions and to see uh, what happens. Um Great black self-respect, him keeping you in the class and being adamant about that. Outstanding black self-respect by the professor uh, running the class who invited you to participate to begin with. And great reading list. Uh, the person who dialed in last four digits, uh, or uh, I guess you dialed in with a headset. The person who dialed in with a headset. Did you have commentary? Yes, I do. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. All right. I have a story. I'll start reading it now. If I'm going on too long, please just stop me. Friday, June 23rd was the auction ball. It was a Dancing with the Stars fundraising event. My wife and I were professional dancers for the event. This is aside from our full-time jobs. I work for the county. Now, while at the event, there were people at the event that I worked with at the county. One being a white woman. She worked directly in the county administration office, and our jobs don't lead us to cross each other each other's path other than in the, in the hallway. Excuse me. The second person was the white man who was the county administrator for the county, the executive, the, the equivalent of a mayor. Both people brought their white spouses to the event. Now, before the event even started, I had a conversation with a black man who was also my wife's dancing partner for Dancing with the Stars. He is black. One of the things we talked about was his ex-wife a white woman. They were married for four years, a tragic arrangement. Before they got married, the white woman wouldn't even tell her parents that they were dating until they were engaged. Her parents responded by disowning her. One of the most, <laughs> one of the most important things he told me about um, his ex-wife was her behavior when she, she got drunk. She turned violent, she flirted, and makes out with other men. And to top it off, she cheated in the marriage. <clears throat> He chose not to cheat for whatever reason. Later on that evening, my wife and I came um, came into contact with the white woman from work in her and exchanged pleasantries. Moments later, her husband joined in on the conversation where the white woman tells her husband that me and my wife dance. My wife and I noticed that he's noticeably drunk. He finds out that we are going to be dancing in the event and he shows how belligerent, his, how belligerently drunk he is. He starts complimenting my wife on her appearance while acting like I'm not even there, while at the same time managing to invade my personal space. Personally, my wife and I worked not to engage him so that he would leave our presence. This doesn't work out so well as he becomes louder and more belligerent and tapping me on the chest with the back of his hand like he's trying to get my attention even though he already has it. <coughs> Excuse me. Meanwhile, his wife is trying to explain what away his behavior saying don't mind him. He's been like that for a while. He's been married for years. We've been married for years. He's fun. 
Afterward, another black male that was at the event who was at a poker table when me and my wife were dealing with the belligerently drunk, and the belligerent drunk and his wife, came over to talk to me about what happened. He said he noticed a look on me and my wife's face and how we wanted nothing to do with the white drunk man's belligerence. It's worth noting <clears throat> that later on in the, later on in the, um later on that night, I overheard him. The same black male having a conversation with another suspected white male, suspected supremacist white male, about black people and white people getting along, and that he doesn't hate white people. The suspected white male said he doesn't hate black people either. Later on that evening, me and my wife's partner, um, me and my wife's partners are getting ready for our dances. He gets into another conversation. He told me about his fraternity days. A black fraternity, he told me about a story about how a white woman got drunk and ended up having sex with two of his fraternity brothers in the bathroom, two of black men. But it didn't even it didn't end there. When people saw her and the two guys coming from the bathroom, people started to wonder what they were up to. It was at that point she started playing and saying that she, well, not playing, saying that she was raped. But before it got too far, my wife's partner intervened and got, and got, and got her friend, and they told her what really went now. At some point, he went by to the bathroom and heard them as they were having sex. One of the things he heard her say calmly was, do you have a condom? Eventually, the situation was diffused by the girl's friends. After my friend concluded the story, I told him that his story was not too far from his marriage to his ex-wife. Just like your white ex-wife, the woman who had sex with the two men didn't want to admit she was sexual soaring. And both white women engaged in behavior that was detrimental to black men, including himself. The woman in the bathroom feigning rape in your ex-wife when she get got drunk and flirt with other men. After my routine, after my routine with my wife, I was I ran into the county administrator. He is shocked at my dancing ability. As we continue to talk, he compliments me on my dancing ability, and I say thanks so much so that he wants potential lessons from me and my wife. As this is going on, I can smell a significant smell of alcohol coming off of his breath. It's no, it's nothing. There, um. Uh, no, I'm well, while while we were dancing, his back was turning the entire time, so I was really wondering what he saw. Eventually, these conversations would change and up uh, would change into conversations about development in the region. As I said before, I work for the county and the planning department. I'm not too far, um, not too far, not too far in the future. The 35 acre lot where County Square resides will be redeveloped. The county administrator talks about how me and my manager need to be pulled into the conversation about the redevelopment because because we work in the planning department. I found this conversation ironic because the day before I was in a similar meeting about a transit plan for the region. The lead consultant, a suspected white female, for the transit plan, said the region has gentrification, but we also have a lot of growth, which is good. Eventually, we make. I'll eventually make it to the end of the night. Outside of the ballroom, I run into the white male suspected, of, white male suspect of the white woman who works with me at the county. Now even drunker and more belligerent. He talks to me about how adorable my wife is and asking, what did you do to get her? How low do you, how low do you hang? At this point, he felt the inside of my knee, at which point I pushed his hand away. You heard that correctly. The suspected white supremacist just sexually assaulted me. At this point, he tried to downplay what he had just said and done. He tried to lead me back into the ballroom by, 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 by my hand, which I declined, and pull away. Then he tries to lead me in with his elbow, with an elbow hole, like when you're leading a female. I declined and pulled away again. Eventually, we end up in the ballroom. He said that, why don't, um, why don't I dance with your wife and I dance with his? He walked over to my wife and just grabbed her to dance. It is at this point I get in between him and my wife, and I say that if you want to dance with my wife, you need to ask her. It is at that point I tell him about all the belligerent behavior that he has been exhibiting throughout the night, the obnoxious behavior, the loudness grabbing my wife. I admitted that I was trying to convince him of what he was doing. Then I realized that I shouldn't be doing that and that I should only be just calling him out, lest I get pulled into a conversation about what he's saying and what he's doing. Eventually, he said uh, he he saw that I was not accepting his behavior, and he decided to squash it and ask him and decided to squash it. And he shook my hand and walked off. In hindsight, I wish I didn't shake his hand. I walked over to my wife to see if she was okay, and she thanked me for intervening. Finally, it's the end of the night. The music is playing, and I'm sitting down. Then the county administrator's wife oh, um comes over to introduce herself to me and ask me to dance. 
I obliged, going so far as to give her a quick dance lesson. I returned to my seat with the sound uh, when the sound goes off. A couple more songs played. Throughout these songs, the county administrator's wife was seductive, seductively signaling, seductive, seductively signaling for me to come back to the dance floor. It was so noticeable that my wife's dance partner noticed. And though my wife and her part and his partner's date were on the dance floor, they didn't. It was at this point my wife's dance partner said that he's been solicited for cuckling for which his date was unaware of the meaning. Now it's the end of the night, and my wife's dance partner and I am getting are gathering our things to leave for the night. I remind him of all the things that had happened to me that night, and that it should be a lesson for him, especially in the area of sex and dating white women. After his after his date leaves, and I'm still waiting on my wife to gather her things so we can leave. When she finally comes out and we leave and make it our way to the car, she tells me that the county administrator's wife joked about leaving the room so one of the other couples, a white couple, can have the room to make out. The woman declines, and the county administrator's wife then jokes and says, well, can I make out with your husband? It's worth noting that the county administrator's wife is in her 60s, and the white couple is probably in their 30s. It's at this point I remember that the county administrator was the subject of a sexual assault case. Seven years later, the county administrator has been at his job for almost a decade and is making $250,000 a year. And that is the end of my story. I'll meet my line. Wow. Well, that is quite a bit. Uh, if anything, um, it would, you know, just reinforce for me the, the whole danger of these sort of uh, environments. I would have been sorry that I participated if I had to endure all of that in uh, one, you know, gigantic dose, myself and my wife, like egad. Um before uh, we run out of time, the, the caller who dialed in uh, last four digits, 6900, uh, thanks for the written response. He got all the details so he wouldn't forget anything. Wow, we. Uh, great job trying to share information with your. Uh, uh, I, did, I did interrupt you, but it took me about four hours to write all that. That's only about two and a half pages on my side. Wow. Great job reading and writing, more important than watching television. Absolutely. Uh, the caller is 6900. Uh, did you have commentary you wanted to get in? 6900? Yes, uh, greetings. That's, uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Greetings. Uh, this is Jay out of New York. Um, greetings to the callers and the listeners. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> kind of uh, got caught up in that uh, that story right before. Um, I guess that goes, only feedback that I have on that is uh, kind of going to the... Um, commentary that Gus always makes, uh, you know, get in and get out for 45, 50 minutes um, if you can and, and get right out of there. But um, sorry, I had to go through that. Um, quickly, I just wanted to touch upon, uh, Gus, you mentioned earlier while I was trying to listen in, in reference to some of the positions, as uh, I think I've mentioned before, I'm an entrepreneur, um, kind of trying to get some funding. So with that, trying to obtain funding, since I'm unable to kind of go through quote unquote, the traditional ways of going to a bank and just having them loan me $500,000. Um, I have to go out and kind of work. So I've been working on a contract where I am doing some hiring. Um, and the hiring um, kind of goes into, I think what was mentioned earlier about these contract positions. Um, they try and turn them as contract to permanent positions. Uh, when I first started out in the HR environment, it used to be like six months to nine months. Contracts um, would go about six to nine months. Now, the position that I've been working on, the contract actually is running two years. Um, I mean, two years as a contractor before you're even given the possibility of going permanent. Um, they give you very streamlined benefits, uh, very low level um, benefit packages uh, during that two year period. And again, there's no guarantee that you'll go permanent, uh, but there's a potential to go permanent. Um, for anybody that's in that scenario, um, they do always have, as you always say, Gus, the discretionary um, opportunity for individuals that they really like to kind of get them on board a lot sooner than the two years. Uh, so for anybody that's in that scenario, um, always ask the question, um, at least after 90 days on the job if you can be considered for that right away and then hopefully that can kind of push you up um, in the priority list of, of trying to at least get uh, a permanent position with the uh, with the company 
Um, I am actually going to be leaving that position. Um, it seemed that they've been hiring a lot of uh, non-white individuals for the lower level positions. Um, they were hiring a lot of individuals that are quote unquote um, individuals that are coming over from international that they're terming uh, Muslim, uh, but these individuals are white. Um, and they've been placing those individuals in the higher positions. And of course, the individuals that are here are being placed in the lower positions. Uh, so I've decided to kind of leave and do something a little different. Um, but I had placed a lot of um, individuals that are non-white in a lot of the higher positions uh, during my time, uh, during my year at the position uh, before I left. So I tried to kind of give back, back as much as I could. I wanted to kind of just uh, quickly respond. The individual that talked earlier about the, that worked at the shoe store, um, early, earlier in my days I used to work at a mall um, they traditionally have undercover officers. Um, I used to work at a movie theater in, in a large mall in New York. Uh, they traditionally have undercover officers in the mall. I would probably ask during a meeting, um, what are the, and I think you mentioned it, like what's the protocol in reference to how things are going to work if there's a situation that escalates and you're unable to handle it? Um, and Traditionally, those undercover officers can be called a lot quicker uh, than individuals that are going to have to come from outside of the mall area. So I would definitely ask about that. In reference to Emmy and the situation, I think she mentioned about um, calling the race soldiers. Um, I would just say uh, definitely be careful because as the race soldiers become more aware with the situation and familiar uh, with her call coming in, uh, they may get on white code and begin to kind of start um, just delaying uh, their speediness and getting to the um, situation. So just try and see if you can kind of get a backup, especially because you're in that vulnerable position of being there alone. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure after one or two calls, they'll definitely see that they're being called and take, you know, some response to their individuals. And they just may get on white code and try and, not even come, you know, at all after a certain time. But just uh, wanted to mention that, knowing the precarious situation that she's in. That's all I had. I'll mute my line. Thanks. Logical observation about the uh, <clears throat> police call situation. White police law. I think uh, there have been records. Uh, I think there was a former black uh, enforcement official, uh, Mr. Fogg, uh, who said that, you know, the white officers admitted openly that they were not going to go and bust white people for, you know, drug offenses. Same thing that you see now with the whole uh, opioid uh, epidemic. These are victims who have, you know, a health condition. They need a pillow and some echinacea. And, you know, certainly we're not going to put them in prison. That's for the Negras. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, consistent in terms of how the uh, system of racism, white supremacy operates. Uh, we are, oh man, <laughs> I didn't see we were that close to the end. Uh, we will be here tomorrow, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, for Gil Scott Heron audio segment or uh, book club, session number four, uh, The Last Holiday, uh, picking up with his college years at Lincoln University, HBCU in Pennsylvania. We'll be here Saturday for the compensatory call in, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. We'll catch up news observations from the past seven days. Uh, get my reminder in if we have black male teachers black male teachers any level uh if you're an educator black male educator uh, i'm writing a story for atlanta black star and it's about the absence of black male teachers they're the smallest uh demographic in the u.s <clears throat> excuse me and uh, i know we have black teachers who shared before on workplace racism about some of the difficulties that they uh, are experiencing <clears throat> excuse me if you want to uh, participate uh, and if you are comfortable uh, being referenced in the report, uh, just drop me an email until justice at gmail dot com. Uh, it would be great if you want to go on record with your name. Great. If you have concerns about that, we could just make it specific to, you know, geographic location. A teacher in the you know Seattle public school system said thus and so. We could do it that way. But drop me an email uh, would be great. I know we do have educators, black male educators out there. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, thanks for everyone who participated. Uh, Jay in New York, the, the last segment, I think that's been a theme for at least today as well. One of the themes, uh, somehow the black people do not get access to those great.
cushy jobs. Uh, they just keep getting those delays and, and don't get the long term permanent uh, employment. Racists, they seem to have a great code for how they make that happen magically uh, everywhere around the world. Uh, with that, uh, we pretty much we did our three hours. I uh, hope it was a constructive investment of your Thursday evening. Sobriety would be best. I heard enough different stories from different office parties and what have you from listeners. Man, sobri- anything, any sort of party you get invited to, job related or what have you. Sobri- if you have to attend, you got to be sober because you already know you are going into this is like the lion's den, the hornet's nest, and the frying pan all at the same time. So, I mean, you have really got to make sure that your brain computer is operating at the highest possible capacity. I don't think that's going to be the case if you've had, you know, four or five shots or smoking cigarettes and all that other stuff. I just don't think you're going to be at your best. Uh, So, yeah, sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. Wars being waged against us at all times. Uh, White people, they already have enough advantages in terms of dominating and abusing black people. We don't need to make their job any easier uh, by not being alert, cognizant and vigilant uh, about our surroundings and what be what might be happening around us at any given moment. That's it. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately cow signing out thanks all for tuning in nigga you so brainwashed i'm a victim brother a victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. Uh.